It's the turn of the 20th century, and you find yourself in Cincinnati, Ohio. You might head down to League Park and catch a Reds game. Maybe you head over to the Cincinnati Zoo, but there was one thing you couldn't pass up, a trip to Coney Island. This got its start in 1867, when apple farmer James Parker bought 20 acres of land on the Ohio River, and this evolved from a picnic area to a small amusement park. There was a carousel, a dining hall, a dancing hall, and a bowling alley. It was deemed the Coney Island of the West, and in 1887, Coney Island became its official name. It was deemed America's favorite amusement park, and its popularity exploded. Ten roller coasters came and went from 1900 to 1940. It added its own steamboat attraction called the Island Queen, and the park thrived through the late 60s. But being located on the Ohio River had its downsides. Mainly, the park was prone to flooding. This caused management to look to relocate the park somewhere else. They found their spot in Deerfield Township, and the move was underway. But would this new park share the success of the beloved Coney Island? 50 years later, that park has evolved into something Cincinnati can be proud of, a destination for parkgoers throughout the country and a bucket list landmark for tourists around the world. This is part one of a five-part documentary celebrating Kings Island on its 50th anniversary. Come with me on this journey over the past five decades to see how this park has become what it is today. Coney Island's 1968 season started with a lot of promise. For its 82nd year, the park was introducing a haunted house, the Olympic Bobs, and a $500,000 log flume, covering over 1,500 feet of track. Within 10 days of the official start of the park's season, an abnormal rainstorm rolled in and overflowed the Ohio River, flooding Coney Island and forcing its closure. This was the latest the park had ever had to deal with flooding, and it had to shut down for Memorial Day. The river was already four feet above flood level, and more rain was on the way. A whole week passed, and park officials were stuck waiting for the river to recede. Ralph Wax, president and general manager of Coney Island, was hoping for a midweek opening, but they were still stuck with at least a 10-day closure during their peak season. Flooding was nothing new. Back in 1964, the park was even submerged in 14 feet of water. But this storm, this late into the year, seemed to be the final straw. In addition, there was limited room for expansion and parking. Gary Wax, the son of Coney Island president Ralph Wax, knew the clock was ticking. It was just a matter of time before this park outgrew its spot along the river, and there was no time like the present to make a change. That year, Coney Island management entered talks with the Taft Broadcasting Company, looking to move the park to a new location. Taft had just acquired the Hanna-Barbera division, and they were looking for a way to promote it. The search was on. In March of 1969, the two sites made their findings public. This would be a 1,200-acre amusement park, 30 miles northeast of Coney Island, 20 miles northeast of Cincinnati, located in Deerfield Township in Warren County. The project was expected to take two or more years. Taft and Coney Island hired consultant Charles Thompson for the project, responsible for work on building Disneyland, Six Flags Over Texas, and Six Flags Over Georgia. Despite this announcement, Ralph Walks promised that Coney Island would operate as usual. In fact, we are going to spend more money on it this year than ever before. He wasn't lying. There was a $1 million expansion program set for 1969. This included a 1,000-seat theater, home of the new Circus 70, and that would put on eight shows every day. This went along with eight new rides, five for adults, including the Sky Slide and the Olympic Bombs, and three for kids. These would go in the Land of Oz and included the Old 99, a train ride. During the week, the park would offer pay one price days, where you could ride everything in the park all day as many times as you want, all for the price of just $4. In April, Taft announced an agreement to buy Coney Island. Taft would acquire all of Coney Island's assets for $6.5 million in stock. The sale was pending approval from Coney Island shareholders and a favorable tax ruling. Officials from Taft stated, Acquisition of Coney is a logical and desirable next step in the progress of the development. The deal was finalized in July, and Coney Island would operate as a division of Taft. The plan was to keep the park open, at least through 1971. In January 1970, Taft elected Ralph Wax as the president and general manager of the Coney Island division, keeping his current position, but now under the Taft umbrella. Shortly after, Taft announced March 15th for the groundbreaking ceremonies for the new park valued at $20 million, and expected the park to be open to the public in May of 1972. This was projected to bring in 2 million people in the first year, 
growing by a quarter million in the years to follow, employing 600 to 800 people in its opening year. The park would be located right off Interstate 71, with an interchange to be built right by the park entrance. The park was just one part of an enormous complex Taft had in the cards. The first phase included the park, an expandable motel, and a campsite along the Little Miami River. The second phase would include a convention center right alongside the motel, as well as a golf course, a lodge, a restaurant, and a monorail or a train connecting all of this. Gary Walks and Charles Flatt, longtime managers at Coney Island, were devoting a full-time effort on the design and construction of the new park, with Flatt being named project manager. With all eyes on the new project, Coney Island was still adding to its lineup. In 1970, they debuted the Galaxy, replacing the Wild Mouse Coaster. People flocked to the park, attendance and spending up over 5% from the prior year, with park officials saying it could be Coney's biggest year to date. Meanwhile, the so-called New Coney finally broke ground three months late in mid-June. Still unnamed, some people were calling the complex Kings Mills Park or Twin Oaks. Charles Meacham, chairman of the board of Taft Broadcasting, said, We are confident the recreational complex will be a credit to the whole area and carry on the tradition that Coney Island has had for years. Officials from Coney Island and Taft were on hand for the ceremonies, along with the mayor of Cincinnati, stating, This will have tremendous impact for total growth in our area. Guests were given a tour of the site, presenting the center of the tract as the site of the $1 million one-third replica of the Eiffel Tower. This would be the largest and most expensive feature of the new park. The park would also be made up of four themed areas, Oktoberfest, Old Coney, Rivertown, and Hanna-Barbera World. Guests would enter the park from International Street, made up of two parallel streets, bordering a reflecting pool larger than a football field. Lining International Street would be a variety of shops with European themes, German, Dutch, an English flea market, and a French bazaar. Dudley Taft stated, Even though we are building a modern park, the old Coney Island has been so popular, we want to retain some of that original concept. Old Coney would feature the park's signature ride, the Racer. These twin wooden coasters would operate side by side, combining for 6,100 feet of track. They also promised a Hanna-Barbera dark ride, where guests travel through an enclosed storyland in boats. While construction crews were busy with the new park site, by the end of the summer of 1970, Taft put Coney Island up for sale following the 1971 season. Per Gary Walks, All our time, talent, and manpower will go into the new operation after 1971. We're not entirely sure what will happen to Coney. We do want to sell the grounds to some company for resort facilities. The sale offer was open to anyone interested in the 155-acre park. But Wax noted the marina, swimming pool, and theater would make for a great picnic area. What they do with the property is up to them. We don't expect Coney Island to be an amusement park. Coney Island drew interest from the city to turn it into a public park. Although the aerial tramway and the roller coasters would be taken out, the swimming pool, dance hall, and theater would remain. By the end of the year, this idea got support from the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Planning Authority. The remaining attractions left behind would be enough to attract patrons, and their paid admission would offset the price of the park. With all these discussions going down, Coney Island set a new attendance record, drawing in more than 1.1 million guests over the summer. As for the new park, Taft held a contest to find an official name in July. 15,000 entries later, they chose the winner, Kings Island. This combined the name of Kings Mills, where the new park would be located, while paying homage to Coney Island. But it was apparent that Taft officials did not love the name. After choosing the winner, they spent five weeks trying to come up with something better. Taft had bigger plans beyond this park, and wanted a name suitable for a series of parks across the country. They already had a plan to open a sister park on the East Coast in the years to come, taking action on 700 acres north of Richmond, Virginia. As the debate on Coney Island's future continued on, the park opened for its 85th and final season in April of 1971. Taft made a special effort to give the park a proper send-off, booking special events on the calendar, along with free concerts from local high school bands, and 10 nights of fireworks to end the season. It is easy to imagine that these generations of Cincinnatians, in whose lives Coney Island has played so significant a role, will do their bit to make Coney's 85th season its greatest. Park officials plan on moving everything they could from Coney Island to Kings Island, including all of the portable rides, the log flume, the equipment in the Land of Oz, and the Sky Ride would be moved, but it would receive new cars from Switzerland. As for the famed roller coaster, Shooting Star, Wax said it would be dismantled and burned. A flea market was planned to auction off everything that couldn't be moved, but park officials canceled it. They realized that everything would either be moved or need to be left for the new buyers. In May, a preview exhibit was set up at Coney Island to showcase the new Kings Island, introducing the park to the Coney patrons with a scale model. Over the years, Coney became more than a park, more than just a magical fantasy land of fun and thrills and breathless wonder for anyone with a handful of tickets. Coney became a symbol of all that was carefree and good and fun in life. Problems and worries waited outside as people danced and swirled and laughed inside. Tommy West, Cincinnati Inquirer.
On September 6, 1971, 20,000 people braved the rain to give Coney Island a final send-off. The day prior, the park set an all-time record with 31,000 guests. They say the park opened in the rain back in 1886. It was only appropriate it rained on the closing date as well. After 85 years, the lights were officially turned out on Coney Island. Less than eight hours after the park closed, workers began dismantling the park. It was scheduled for a six-week plan to move or scrap everything. 13 of the 31 rides would make their way to Kings Island. In mid-October, James Figley, director of maintenance, said, We were genuinely surprised to find how easy the rides were to tear down. To date, we have moved most of the rides, and by November 1st, we plan to have the old rides installed. This even includes 35 ginkgo trees transplanted to the new Coney Mall section of the park. With Coney Island closed, all eyes were on Kings Island. Jack Nicholas announced that he would build a $1.2 million golf course adjacent to Kings Island, featuring a main course and executive course, both 18 holes. This would be ready for the summer of 1972 to coincide with the park's opening. The Eiffel Tower was complete in May, and the paint job was set to begin. 800 gallons of green paint, 10,000 pieces on the tower, all painted with a brush from the 340-foot peak on down. They also had to build around an abandoned graveyard in the parking lot and bulldoze a house after a legal fight. Kings Island, now valued at $30 million, said its preview begins to start April 29th, with the grand opening on May 27th. Admission would be $6 for adults, $5 after 6 p.m., and officials claim the park could handle 75,000 people per day without excessive wait times. The park announced it was taking applications for 1,500 summer jobs, and there was an eight-hour line of applicants the first two days. The park was staffed and ready for its first preview day, right on schedule. But like Coney Island's first day and last day, Kings Island was greeted with rain. Only about 4,000 people came through the gates on April 29th, with no traffic jam coming off I-71 and no lines in front of the rides, with the exception of the Racer and Eiffel Tower. Some rides had no names in front of them, and many of the ones that were open were running slow. Still, many of the guests were impressed with the vast amusement park. I had to see if it had anything on Coney. It does. It has everything on Coney. Lane Evan. Others were noticing the bad differences between Kings Island and Coney Island. One guest noted that Kings Island did not allow picnic baskets in the park, something that was an important part of Coney Island's culture. The park used the next month to smooth things out, and by May 27th, it was ready for its grand opening. Opening ceremonies for the park kicked off at 10 a.m. in front of 5,000 people. 1,000 employees paraded down International Street with five marching bands, two Fred Flintstone rockmobiles, fireworks, and 20,000 balloons released at the end. By the early afternoon, there were 12,000 people in the park. By the end of the day, 18,000 people had passed through the gates. The consensus seemed to be it's almost too much to see in one day. The park had 23 rides and shows for adults, nine of them coming from Coney Island. This included the Sky Ride, the Rotor, Flying Carpet, Monster, Scrambler, Grand Carousel, Cuddle Up, Flying Eagles, and one roller coaster, the Bavarian Beetle. This was the Galaxy Coaster that opened in 1970. The original rides included the Kings Island and Miami Valley Railroad, Der Spin and Kagers, Halley's Comet, Les Taxis, Otto Livery, Wheel of Fortune, Kenton Cove's Canoes, Shawnee Landing, The Enchanted Voyage, Eiffel Tower, and the star attraction, The Racer. There was also the Royal Fountain Bandstand, the Kings Island Theater, and the Aqua Arena for marine animal shows. In the happy land of Hanna-Barbera, there were 11 rides, plus the Hanna-Barbera Amphitheater, the two most notable ones being the King's Mills Log Flume, relocated from Coney Island, and Scooby-Doo, a small family wooden coaster. There would also be costume characters from the Hanna-Barbera world throughout the park, including Scooby-Doo, the Flintstones, and most of all, the Banana Splits. King's Island was popular right out of the gate, and it drew some immediate attention. Within two weeks of its grand opening, the Partridge family agreed to film at least one episode at the park that summer. The ABC TV series would be the first network exposure for King's Island, the first summer was a smashing success. Over its first month and a half, Kings Island had outperformed Coney Island's normal performance by 66% in attendance and doubled their earnings. As task president, Lawrence Rogers said, Kings Island is living up to the hopes that it would be a place of laughter and joy. Laughter for the patrons and joy on the part of management. Not surprisingly, Taft and top value enterprises decided to proceed with the park in Richmond, Virginia, with Kings Island general manager Gary Wax taking the same role with that project. He would move to Richmond, being replaced by Edward McHale, the one millionth guest passed through the turnstiles in July, and she and her family were given three free days at the park, motel reservations, free golf at the Jack Nicholas courses, and $100 spending money. 
The park capped off its first season with a fireworks spectacle, moving to weekend-only operation. This included Senior Citizens Days on Sundays in September, where guests aged 60 or older could get in for just $3. One woman was said to blow off paying all her utilities and come to the park, using the last $3.50 to her name to get in, hitchhiking the whole way there, and the park employees gave her the royal treatment, even giving her a ride home at the end of the night. Kings Island was endearing itself to its new community and trying to win over the Coney Island diehards, the ones who felt slighted that their charming little park was replaced. Although I cherish fond memories of Coney and always will, Kings Island is certainly the Tiffany of amusement parks. Mary Wood, Cincinnati Post. By the time the park closed for the year in late October, Kings Island had brought in at least one guest from every single one of the 50 U.S. states. More than 2 million people came to Warren County to visit the park, creating an economic boom for hotels, restaurants, and other shops. There were as many as 1,500 people working at the park during the summer, tallying a payroll of $4.25 million. Their first season of 1972 was everything everyone thought it could be, and more. It was time to expand. During the off-season, the Kings Island Inn added 80 rooms. The park also signed a lease with the California-based Lion Country Safari, bringing live animals to the park. This would be an upcharge for the park when it was open, and would operate as a separate entity in the off-season, set to debut in 1974. The park also held open auditions for over 200 live performers the next season. These would be singers, dancers, actors, and musicians, performing in more than 15 areas of the park. As 1973 kicked off, the Partridge Family episode filmed at the park aired on January 26. Gary Wax was named vice president of the Kings Island Kings Dominion Family Entertainment Centers, the new park in Richmond having adopted its official name and set to open in 1975. The park reached out to the community for 1,500 workers for a second season, but crews were working tirelessly all winter, implementing all the additions that came along with a $6 million expansion. This included a restaurant over the main gate, overlooking the park's International Street. This would be open year-round. There would also be three new rides. The Bayern Curve, a Schwarzkopf circular bobsled. The Flying Dutchman, a swing ride with gondolas shaped as wooden shoes. And Kenton's Cove Keelboat Canal, a hydro flume. Rounding out the additions was a games and arcade building and a half-mile nature trail. Edward McHale projected 2.2 million guests in 1973, about a 10% increase. Opening weekend had a host of special events, including a parade, a hot air balloon race, a team of four skydivers, the human fly climbing up the Eiffel Tower, Air Force jets doing a flyover, and a fireworks show every night at 10 p.m. The crowds poured in. Over the first month and a half in 1973, the park had a 30% increase in attendance and a 38% increase in net revenue. Kings Island's 3 millionth visitor came to the park in July, presented with a plaque by a skydiver, got a ride in the hot air balloon, plus other prizes. The Lion Country Safari was getting geared up to storm the park the next year, with 16 zebras and a dozen rhinos arriving at the park at the end of the summer. Following the lead of the Partridge family, the Brady Bunch shot an episode at the park in August. The year ended with kids under 12 getting free admission if they arrived in a full Halloween costume, with the park ducked out in Halloween decorations and costume characters. It was a fine way to end a season that outpaced their own projections, pulling in 2.3 million people and earning $1 million more in profits from his opening year. Over at Coney Island, Taft decided to take the park off the market. They wanted $3.5 million for the land, a price too high for public use, and private developers were scared off by the flooding issue. They decided to turn the land into a pay-for-play recreational park, fit for recreational vehicles, and right away, they looked into installing tennis courts and a mini golf course. When Paul Ilyinsky came out with his tribute to Coney Island, Goodbye Coney Island, goodbye. Kings Island bought 320 hardbound copies and gave them to local schools. They wanted young students who visit the new park to know what the old park was like. 1974 kicked off with a price hike for admission, going from six to seven dollars. This was also under the backdrop of an energy shortage. Following OPEC's oil embargo that started the prior October, Taft was confident that Kings Island would not suffer, being within 150 miles of 10.5 million people, and 83% of their attendance already came from that area. The Lion Country Safari was their big new draw, but there were other reasons to visit the park in 1974. Carl Walenda broke the world high wire walk record, covering 1,800 feet, 60 feet above the ground, lasting 29 minutes and even doing two headstands along the way. Firestone also sponsored a new air show, where the Kings Island hot air balloon would rise up and small planes would do aerobatics around it. Kings Island enjoyed another record year, with 2.6 million people coming to the park. Taft believed the gas shortage would not hurt the park, and they were vindicated. 70% of the guests came from Ohio, up 12% over the prior year, and profits rose over 20%. They would press forward with $3.5 million in park improvements, highlighted by a 130-foot double Ferris wheel called Zodiac, as well as a Hus spinning ride called Troika. Lion Country Safari would open a 1,500-seat amphitheater for an exotic bird show. The safari would remain open during the off-season, charging $3 for adults and $1.75 for kids. There was also an unexpected expense that arose in the winter. On December 1st, the Kings Island Theater collapsed under heavy snow and had to be rebuilt. 
1975 season saw the first step in attendance in the park's four-year history, but the small decrease was not enough to hurt the park's bottom line. The price for parking was doubled, from 50 cents to a dollar, and with increased prices for food and merchandise, gross revenues were slightly up. Taft officials were not worried. Charles Meacham said, It is now clear that Kings Island is an established, successful operation and will achieve a long-term growth pattern which will continue to make it an excellent investment. Aside from the new rides and shows, the park featured country stars Conway Twitty and Loretta Lynn, but the big draw in 1975 was Evil Knievel. He was going to cap off the year on October 25th by jumping over 14 buses in the Kings Island parking lot claiming this to be his final jump of his career. Kings Island was selling tickets in advance for $12 to see the jump and visit the park. $8 just to see the jump. The jump would be televised on ABC's Wide World of Sports, blacked out in Cincinnati, Dayton, and Columbus. This was because the park was building the largest temporary arena in U.S. history, seating 70,000 people. Once the day of the jump came around, only 25,000 filled the seats. It was a cold, blustery day, and his jump fell well short of the mark, landing on the plywood that covered the last three buses. Needing 30 to 35,000 just to break even, Kings Island took a loss on the event. But there was one major silver lining. The ABC Wide World of Sports broadcast brought in 32 million viewers, the largest audience in the show's 15-year history. This gave Kings Island an unprecedented level of national exposure. 1976 started with another hike in the admission price, from $7 to $8, along with a 50-cent surcharge for the Lion Country Safari. The Safari would feature some new additions, 10 Bengal Tigers and 50 Olive Baboons. But as exciting as new animals can be, they can pose unique challenges. Eleven days before the park opened for the season, the 50 baboons escaped their enclosure. The park used food traps to lure them back in, but by opening day, 13 were still on the loose. One of them was believed to have left the park, but the others were roaming the general park area. Park officials said the baboons were not dangerous unless cornered, and fully intended on opening the park on time. It took a couple weeks, but the park was able to catch the final two baboons, using food laced with a tranquilizer. 48 of the baboons were shipped back to the Animal Exchange in Michigan. The other two remained in their preserve. The sign on their cage read, Here are a few of the baboons that made monkeys out of us. More serious was an incident in July, when a 20-year-old safari ranger was mauled and killed by lions. The rangers were told to never leave their cage like jeeps, but it appears he broke protocol. Investigators believe he left the jeep to relieve himself, and was killed by lions trying to get back to his jeep. OSHA would find the park $2,400 for safety violations, reduced to $800 once the park showed they were taking steps to ensure this would never happen again. The park also introduced the American Heritage Music Hall, a $1.8 million theater with nine shows every day, as well as the Follies Marionette Show. But Taft was always thinking outside the box, and they wanted a whole new attraction for the Kings Island Complex. They made an agreement with the College Football Hall of Fame to locate adjacent to the park, with the park already bringing in 2.5 million people a year, with the goal of 3.5 million in the future, they figured if 10% of those people visited the Hall of Fame, it would be profitable. They had only developed half of the 1,600 acres and felt like the park and the hall would benefit from each other. Instead of being a one-day pit stop, the Kings Island complex could grow into a multi-day destination. The groundbreaking ceremony took place in August, slated for a 1978 opening. The two-story building would cover 38,000 square feet on a plot of land spanning 10 acres and including a football field. By the end of the year, Edward McHale was promoted within Tass Amusement Park Group, leaving the general manager job to William Price, the director of marketing. Despite a tumultuous year, attendance and revenue were up. The park said goodbye to Cuddle Up, a Coney Island original flat ride, as well as Shawnee Landing, the canoe ride. But for the first time in the park's short history, a new coaster was on the horizon, described as a 360-degree looping roller coaster, with four cars, 16 passenger trains along 500 feet of track at 45 miles per hour, through a 56-foot high, 360-degree vertical loop, up a second 50-foot incline. Then, after a pause, the riders are catapulted through a loop to the starting point, backwards. This was Scream and Demon, a brand new model from Aerodynamics, the company behind the first modern inverting coaster one year prior, and now introducing a launch shuttle coaster. This was one of three being introduced for 1977. There would also be a new facility called Stadium of the Stars for celebrity entertainers, as well as a new show called Hooray for Hollywood, a musical salute to the silver screen. They opened the season with a 50s rock and roll weekend featuring Dick Clark, and ended the season with their country music celebration. In the park's final few days, President Jimmy Carter's brother, Billy Carter, made an appearance for the so-called Peanut Olympics, featuring six Peanut-themed events. The one mishap during the season happened right off the bat in April, as the sky ride broke down in a wind and rainstorm, stranding 45 people for up to 8 hours waiting for the fire department to rescue them. In the end, despite the new coaster, attendance was down 1%, but spending was up 11%. The Kings Island Theater that collapsed three years prior and was repaired, was retired for good after the 1977 season, replaced by Tower Gardens. 
1978 also brought in four new live shows, as well as penguins to the freshly renamed Wild Animal Safari. The College Football Hall of Fame was dedicated in early August, drawing in almost 3,500 people over its first four days, a promising sign. Not so promising was the future of Bavarian Beetle. The park was being sued by an 87-year-old man whose neck was broken after riding the coaster. In October, the case was sent to the Ohio Supreme Court, but the Bavarian Beetle was gone by then. In the middle of the 1978 season, the coaster was removed in favor for a Ferris wheel, Kings Island's first coaster to be removed. While Kings Island was removing a coaster, the rival to the north was adding one. Cedar Point, located on Lake Erie in northern Ohio, had just opened the world's tallest coaster, Gemini, an aerodynamic stool hybrid coaster, standing 125 feet tall. But Kings Island had come this far, going big every step of the way, and they were about to unveil a new coaster, one that was not only unprecedented for its time, it remains a record holder to this day. To this a record day. holder. A record holder to this day. <laughs> The United States is experiencing a roller coaster boom. More new coasters are being built than any time since 1920, and the best, or worst, is yet to come. Right here, at Kings Island, what is billed as the fastest, highest, longest coaster in the world will open next spring. They said it was a roller coaster. There should be another name for it, but I can't think of one. It is unlike anything I've ever experienced. In the summer of 1978, Kings Island's cross-state rival was raising their game. Cedar Point was set to debut Gemini, a dual-track coaster just like Kings Island's racer. Only, the train ran on a steel track on a wooden structure, and this one was 37 feet taller. At 125 feet, Gemini was the world's tallest coaster. Kings Island was just a year removed from opening Scream and Demon, but with the closure of the Bavarian Beetle, it was time for another major addition. Where Cedar Point looked at aerodynamics to build Gemini, Kings Island would stay in-house for this new project. Charles Dinn had seen the construction of many of the park's major rides from the start, and in 1973, he was named the manager of maintenance and construction. He was tasked with this new coaster. In the summer of 1978, the park announced the new project would reach record-breaking speeds of 68 miles per hour. Then, it was revealed to have an astounding 7,400 feet of track. This was about 2,000 feet longer than the current record holder. Then, the park revealed the first drop would stand 141 feet, topping Gemini's first drop at 23 feet. As roller coaster enthusiast and author Gary Kiriazzi said, this is the ultimate. By November, the $3.2 million coaster was 60% complete. Kings Island enjoyed a record year of attendance, topping 2.6 million people and bringing in a record amount of revenue. Taft was looking to expand once again. They initially sought out a park north of Chicago, but would end up agreeing on a deal in Canada. This new park would be called Canada's Wonderland, located in Vaughan, just northwest of Toronto, and was slated for a 1981 opening. 1979 started off on a bad note, as a barn caught fire in the Wild Animal Safari, Five antelopes perished in the blaze. In February, the park gave a name to the world's tallest, longest, and fastest coaster, covering 35 acres in the southeast corner of the park, the Beast. The buzz around the Beast empowered the park to raise the admission price 75 cents to 9.50, and for the first time ever, they would offer a season pass. This would cost $34.95 before the season started, and $39.95 after opening day. This helped pay for the $6 billion in off-season improvements more than half of that going towards the Beast, and this included a new country show, as well as the Yabba Dabba Doo Caperoo, a $500,000 show that required a new wing on the American Heritage Music Hall. The season pass was meant to encourage locals to come back to the park multiple times during the year, something that became very important during the second energy crisis of the decade. Park officials thought the gas shortage could help their business as people tried to stay close to home, but a federal proposal to limit weekend gasoline sales was protested by the park. Gary Watts testified in person in front of the Energy Subcommittee, explaining how this would hurt the amusement park industry and every business around it. The shortage was evident early in the summer, as attendance was down and employee hours were having to be cut. But the park did what they could to help, including installing gas availability boards, showing out-of-town guests where they can get enough gas to make it home. Taft even considered installing its own pumps, but they had to give up on that idea once they realized it wasn't legal. The park may have suffered mid-season as the gas supply dried up, but it was the place to be when it opened for the season in April. The Beast opened to rave reviews. Ordinary folk would call it a roller coaster, but to the Cincinnati chic, it's already simply The Beast, period. William R. Burley, Cincinnati Post. In May, The Beast drew a three and a half hour line. It boosted the park to record preseason attendance. However, the coaster wasn't for everyone. 
When the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, was asked if he rode the beast, he said, I may be brave, but I'm not a dummy. There was also some concern about roller coaster safety, as a few months prior, a woman fell to her death on the world's tallest coaster at the time, Colossus at Magic Mountain. Charles then was adamant they used every precaution, testing with sandbags and measuring g-forces. He mentioned that John Allen, the designer of the racer, was involved in the planning, along with a civil engineer and other consultants. With electric configuration, they could tell where every car was at all times. In the spring, Taft came out with a 10-year, $50 million expansion plan, including three major rides, expansion of the International Showcase Theater, and maybe a huge mountain ride like King's Dominion had just received. Although General Manager William Price said he didn't think that anything could top the beast for a while, he said construction for another roller coaster would begin after the park closed in the fall. All he said is it would be different and it would have no loops. It was a roller coaster with different characteristics. The beast was making everyone optimistic, and the park was being heaped with praise. There was a survey conducted by Amusement Park Annual, and they named Kings Island the top seasonal park in the US and Canada, ranking third overall, just behind the Disney parks in California and Florida. In the end, the park overcame the gas shortage and drew in 2.4 million people, up about 100,000 from 1978. By the end of the 1979 season, Halley's Comet and the Skyride gave their final rides, and the park started construction on a three-acre expansion to the Conference Center and the Kings Island Inn. The Beast also got some upgrades over the off-season, including some steeper banking and a 371-foot tunnel at the end of the ride. Scooby-Doo, the family wooden coaster, was renamed Beastie. The park would also start offering live elephant rides with an upcharge. Meanwhile, riding the wave from the popularity of the Beast, the park was hyping up their next big ride. William Price called it a totally new concept. There is nothing like it in the whole world. Admission prices would also rise once again, from 950 to 1050. With the economy in recession, amusement parks across the country had to be careful with their prices, but still have enough income to build the next big attraction to keep drawing in the crowds. Some were more dedicated than others. In August of 1980, Carl Eichelman boasted his 1,000th ride on the beast, but the recession and high inflation was too much to overcome, and Taft blamed that on the attendance dropping 10%. But Kings Island had something up its sleeve to get back on their feet. And it turns out that much discussed new attraction would live up to the hype. In the shadows of falling darkness, wings of the night creature await their silent signal from the moon. Darting madly through a starless sky, the frenzied flight of the bat takes you by surprise and leaves you breathless, hanging in midair, captured alive by the bat. Fly the bat at King's Island. It's a non-stop fright. The Bat would be the world's only suspended roller coaster, a design attempted in Germany five years prior, but it had design issues and the project was scrapped. The cars would hang under the track and swing out when they hit the curves. Park engineer Walt Davis said the coaster had a safety design factor of 300%, making it three times stronger and safer than needed. Unlike the Beast, the park would dole out this project to Aero Development, the same company that built Gemini two years prior, and this would come with a $3.8 million price tag. Despite this expense, Kings Island dropped their season pass price by $15 for the 1981 season, selling them for only $24.95. Before the season even started, they had sold two-thirds as many passes as they sold in 1980. As the 1981 season approached, Walt Davis took his first ride on the bat, being one of the first riders to ever experience a one-of-a-kind coaster. He didn't know exactly how to describe it. The coaster goes into a God-knows-what-happens-next segment, with several twists and impending collisions. At one point, it appears the cars are heading toward a solid mass of steel beams, and you're going to smear up against the wall. That really got me. Initial testing proved there was too much speed and the ride was too wild. The speed had to be reduced and the rails adjusted. The bat opened with the park for the season, but such is the case for any prototype, it experienced a lot of downtime. Kings Island was hoping their other new addition for 1981 would help improve guest morale, and that was their team of 18 street performers, roaming the park and entertaining small groups of guests at a time. This included magicians, ventriloquists, and mimes. But the bat would be up and down all season. By August, the park estimated it was down about 30% of the time. One of the initial problems was misaligned parts on the lift chain, causing abnormal wear on some parts, and the computer automatically shutting the ride down. In late August, tensions started to mount. The park once said they were pleased with the amount of downtime given the circumstances. Now, the new general manager, F.R. Bush, said it had accelerated to the point that is unacceptable, and the inconsistent operation had inconvenienced guests. Aero development was called out during a week and a half shutdown right before the summer season ended. While battling the bat's ongoing problems, Kings Island had their best attendance yet in 1981 and looked ahead to 1982, their 10th year in operation. After adding three new thrilling coasters over the last five seasons, they spent $2.1 million on an expansion for Hanna-Barbera Land. This would include 20 new and renovated rides, along with a new kids admission price of $5.95 for those 4 to 6 years old. They would continue the success of their discount season passes, charging $27.50. The whole Kings Island complex was expanding also, 
A football stadium was being built next to the College Hall of Fame. This was to be used by local high schools, as well as a 7,500-seat tennis stadium and a factory outlet mall. Inside the park, there was even more to offer, and this was despite the rotor having been closed after the prior season. But they did add the world's largest swinging ship, Viking Fury. For its 10th anniversary, the racer turned one of its trains around, offering the world's first full-length backward coaster. They closed the Stadium of the Stars the year prior, and replaced it with a 10,000-seat, $500,000 amphitheater right behind Scream and Demon. When Taft conducted a survey back in 1981, asking guests what they value most in the park, it wasn't the rides, it was the entertainment. When the director of marketing, Tom Nolan, was asked about the new amphitheater, he said, Live shows have developed into a major reason why people come to Kings Island, and we can enhance that effect by bringing name acts to the amphitheater. It was to be called Timberwolf, and it opened on July 9th. This included acts from Air Supply, Livingston Taylor, with the Oak Ridge Boys being booked shortly after. The initial price for a concert was $13.50, and that included park admission. Throughout the rest of the 1982 season, Timberwolf would sell out with acts like the Beach Boys, the Go-Go's, Joan Jett, and the Steve Miller Band. At the end of the year, Kings Island prepared for its first annual Winterfest, a first among the nation's theme parks, keeping the park open through the end of December. The Royal Fountain would be turned into an ice skating rink, the Eiffel Tower decorated like a giant Christmas tree. There would be other activities for kids and holiday items to buy and eat, and construction would start on the $2.5 million Fest House, a 1,500-seat indoor dining hall. This would cost $2.50 per person, with pass holders getting in free. The park noted the turnout for Winterfest was beyond their expectations. In fact, it was double their expectations, ending up with 271,000 people and guaranteeing a return the next year. It wasn't all fun and games in 1982. In May, another park ranger was mauled by a lion, Luckily, he was saved by another ranger who ran the lion with a shotgun, but still required emergency surgery after being bitten on the neck and the head. Meanwhile, the bat's problems continued. The ride malfunctioned on May 21st, and the park decided to suspend operation indefinitely. Arrow Huss was called out and told the park they could have it ready to open in a month, only citing the failure of a weld as a problem. It ended up being closed for the majority of the year. By the time the summer season ended, attendance was down 4% to 2.5 million. The Bayern Curve was removed after the season, and the park wasted no time announcing its replacement. In February 1983, a deal was struck with Togo Japan Incorporated for the country's first stand-up looping coaster. A pair of Kings Island representatives went to Japan to ride the model, and they were pleased with it, so they ordered one for the 1984 season. But as for 1983, there were no new rides, but the park invested $5 million into new entertainment, adding 2,000 more entertainment hours compared to 1982. F.R. Bush stated that it was now possible for someone to spend the entire day just watching shows. Fest House was built for Winterfest and would now be repurposed for live stage shows during the summer. This was called World Cabaret. As for Timberwolf, it would more than double its concert schedule. This was headlined by Mikhail Baryshnikov, part of the American Ballet Theater in New York, as well as Cool and the Gang and Men at Work. During grad night in May, a 17-year-old guest was killed after falling down the elevator shaft of the Eiffel Tower. It was determined that he entered a restricted area and attempted to climb a section of the tower when he fell. The bat was entering its third season, and despite a week-long closure due to a hairline crack on a wheel, the park said the ride was up 95% of the time. The second annual Winterfest was even bigger than the first year, featuring a new marionette show, showing movies in the American Heritage Music Hall, and stretching into the Rivertown area where kids can visit Mr. and Mrs. Claus. There was also a display advertising the still unnamed stand-up coaster coming the next spring. Without any new rides to boast, attendance was down 5%, but Taft was still seeing record revenues across his three parks. In the closing days of 1983, Taft decided to sell their parks to an investor group for over $167 million. This group included members of his own management team, and the new general manager would be T. Lewis Hooper. Taft was anticipating the FCC would loosen up the rules on how many stations they were allowed to own, and wanted to free up some cash to acquire more. They would still own the other entities within the Kings Island complex, and the parks could still use the Hanna-Barbera branding. The new company would be called the Kings Entertainment Company, led by Nelson Schwab III, headquartered at Kings Island. Now this cold bread, Kings Island, isn't exactly what you'd expect. It's a new $3 million roller coaster, the only stand-up, looping coaster in this country. Folks at Kings Island say it will be ready for local daredevils by April. They traveled to Japan and tried it out before they decided to bring it here. And yes, even after they got on, looped the loop and lost their sake, they bought it anyway. <laughs> this newest in a line of hair-raising fun rides got its name democratically. Visitors to the park voted to name it the King Cobra. When the calendar turned over to 1984, the park's newest thrill ride had a name, King Cobra, with a price tag of $3 million, over 2,034 feet of track, and a signature 360-degree loop. For the kids, the Smurfs had a new show at the International Showplace, and the Enchanted Voyage was rethemed as a Smurf village. As a tie-in with the new Smurf theme, the park debuted Blue Ice Cream. 
This temporary gimmick turned into the park's most popular treat to this day. Before the season even started, the park announced the bat was being reviewed by management. Its status for opening day was in question. After its best year of operation yet, the park was still trying to find a solution to its problems. With the rest of the coasters being operational for the park's opening day, plus the brand new King Cobra, they figured it was a good time to try and fix its long-term problems. Still, Kings Island officials said the shutdown should only be temporary. King Cobra opened without a hitch, but it was another ride, in another park, in another state that caused the park headaches. In July, a woman was killed on Railblazer at Six Flags Over Mid-America, a mine train coaster that was just fitted for stand-up trains that year. Kings Island stressed the same type of accident would not happen on their new stand-up coaster, and they did not notice the line for King Cobra diminish from Leary Gas. However, the next month, eight people were injured when a wheel assembly fell off the train mid-ride. The train started shaking when it was heading around a curve, and then it came to a halt. This accident came shortly after the state of Ohio signed a bill into law to inspect all permanent amusement rides, and that was to take effect January 1st of the following year. King Cobra was set to be closed for two weeks, as representatives from Togo flew out to help diagnose the problem. A faulty spindle in the wheel assembly turned out to be the culprit. The park would face a $2.5 million lawsuit from three members of a family that were on the ride. While King Cobra was having its mid-season problems, the bat remained closed for the whole season. By November, the park confirmed the inevitable. The bat would soar no more. The park released the official line for its permanent closure, and that was it did not operate up to the standards guaranteed by the manufacturer. More candidly, Park spokeswoman Ruth Voss said the ride was just too fast. We put on different brakes. We did a lot of things to slow it down. None of them worked right. Kings Island took this opportunity to announce plans for a replacement for the 1986 season. But for the 1985 season, work started in the early summer for the brand new $4 million river raft ride. This was a big success at Kings Dominion in 1983, and the Kings Entertainment Company hoped to capitalize on it. The park didn't need much help, as 1984 turned out to be their biggest year ever, hitting the 3 million guest mark for the first time the record-breaking guests coming through the gates during Winterfest. The lucky guest and his family were treated to lunch at Fest House, dinner at the International Restaurant, passes for 1985, a Kodak camera, and a $100 shopping spree at Kroger. T. Lewis Hooper attributed the rise, of course, to King Cobra, but also an improved economy and more season passes sold. They also brought in marquee acts at Timberwolf, including Moody Blues, Cindy Lauper, Huey Lewis and the News, and the Oak Ridge Boys. As the 1985 season kicked off, Kings Island said goodbye to a park original, the Wheel of Fortune. The future of the bat was already determined, but shortly before the season started, it was finally dismantled. On a brighter note, Whitewater Canyon was testing by January, the park's marquee edition for 1985. But there was also New Waves, a place for people to record themselves singing in a sound booth, and that tape would be for sale for $9.95. The park also unveiled a first-of-its-kind message center at the Eiffel Tower. This is where guests could leave messages for each other, helping lost parties get back together. Timberwolf's schedule was packed once again, featuring Jimmy Buffett, Kenny Loggins, Weird Al Yankovic, among others. This would cost $15.95 to see the concert and enter the park, or $5 for season pass holders. In addition, the park featured 12 live shows throughout the summer. One of the more bizarre incidents of the year happened in September, when a fire started underneath the beast, singeing some riders and sending 16 people to the first aid station, causing $5,000 of damage to the ride. Still, the park set a summer record, falling just short of the 3 million guest mark. Like with King's Dominion, King's Island Whitewater Canyon ride was a big draw. 243,000 people attended Winterfest, bringing the year's total to over 3.2 million. The Tumblebug was retired after the 1985 season, a park original that had a history at Coney Island going back to 1925. But the park was planning three new rides. One was called Skylab, a Huss Enterprise, Zephyr, a Zero Wave Swinger, and Dodgem, the Bumper Cars. They also opened the Cinema 180 Theater, a 60 by 30 foot screen designed to immerse its viewers into the action. In February, the King's Entertainment Company announced the big move. Their headquarters would be leaving Kings Island and heading over to Charlotte, North Carolina, putting it close to the park they acquired 11 years prior, Carowinds. Without a major new ride, Kings Island was looking for ways to boost their attendance. With the price of gas falling, they started advertising in other cities like Pittsburgh. For only 63 cents a gallon, projected to go down as low as 50 cents by summer, the 12-hour round trip between Pittsburgh and Kings Island was said to cost half of what it did the year prior. Cheap gas, good weather, and the three new flat rides led to early season success. By June, park officials said they were on pace for another record-setting year. And, as promised by 1986, they were also ready to announce what was going to replace the bat.
Vortex was said to be a one-of-a-kind coaster, a ride designed exclusively for King's Island. The only coaster to combine two loops, two core screws, and a boomerang at one time, making for six inversions a new world record. At the price of $4 million, this would be built by Aerodynamics, the same company that tried and failed with the bat. It would be ready for the 1987 season. Meanwhile, in 1986, Timberwolf continued to be a popular venue for big-name acts. The park's goal was to put 12 new shows, concentrating on the sure hits, but also mixing in some new acts. Jimmy Buffett was the biggest draw, selling out the venue two nights in a row, and other acts included the Pointer Sisters and James Taylor. Summer attendance fell just short of their 1985 mark, but everyone was optimistic going into 1987 with their groundbreaking new coaster. At King's Island Amusement Park, the racer is a whoopee cushion compared to this. The demon is, well, mere training wheels for Vortex. Lou Moore's Cincinnati Post. When Vortex opened, it drew lines of three hours, though once they started operating with all three trains, it went down to about an hour. The high capacity ride would chew through its line, going through over 130,000 riders in less than a month. With the debut of one aero coaster, Kings Island was ready to part with another. They put the demon up for sale that summer, with the park initially saying it was to make room for expansion to the wild animal habitat. A month later, the park announced the demon would be replaced by Amazon Falls, an intimate shoot the shoots water ride. The demon appeared to have a buyer, the owner of Funspot in Angola, Indiana. He put in a down payment and expected the sale to be complete by summer. However, this would end up being sold to West Virginia's Camden Park, and Funspot would have to wait three more years to buy the same model, once Florida's Boardwalk and Baseball closed and the Zoomerang Coaster was looking for a new home. But it was another sale that would make waves. In August, the American Financial Corporation, owned by Cincinnati-based businessman Carl Lindner, agreed to buy Kings Island. The Kings Entertainment Company would continue to operate the park and would retain ownership of its other properties. Lindner had just purchased Taft Broadcasting as well, bringing the two companies back under the same ownership once again. For the first time in Kings Island's history, its summer attendance topped the 3 million mark, coming in at over 3.1 million. The first year under Carl Lindner started with the admission going up a dollar, up to $16.95 now for adults. But guests were treated to the $1.8 million Amazon Falls. This would lift riders up 45 feet, turn around, and plunge into the 800,000 gallons of water at the bottom, soaking everyone from head to toe, both on the boat and on the two observation decks. The new ride was right next to Timberwolf, who had another big-time slate of performances queued up for 1988, including James Taylor, Gloria Estefan, Tiffany with New Kids on the Block, The Jets, The Beach Boys, and Richard Marks, who griped that park management wouldn't let him stay to ride the rides. In June, a drought forced the park to cancel their nightly fireworks display. This returned after the area was drenched with rain a month later, and it was an appropriate time to announce their big addition for 1989, Waterworks. This was the first time in the park's history that it added a whole new themed area. This $4.2 million expansion would be included with park admission, being located behind the railroad, cover 12 acres, and feature a lazy river and over a dozen water slides. Given the popularity of Whitewater Canyon and the new Amazon Falls, plus their own internal research, Kings Island and other parks across the chain were doubling down on water attractions. But across the state, Cedar Point was going in a different direction. I guess you could say that direction was up. Well, what goes up must come down. Kings Island's racer has been credited with sparking a coaster renaissance, but Cedar Point's Magnum XL200 would thrust the coaster world into overdrive, and Kings Island would find themselves right in the middle of it in the decades to come. The Midwest is on the fast track of roller coaster activity, including the golden triangle of roller coasters. Cedar Point, Kennywood, and Kings Island. Together, they represent the best of the coaster genre. Get to the 
When Magnum XL200 was announced for Cedar Point in the summer of 1988, maybe it wasn't apparent the effect it would have on the industry. There were other signs. Six Flags Great Adventure announced the Great American Screen Machine at the same time, and the year prior, Six Flags Great America opened the world's first seven inversion coaster in Shockwave. This meant King's Island's Vortex only held the inversion record for one year. Meanwhile, at the park, Waterworks was gearing up for its grand opening, with the park having to reroute the railroad to accommodate the new water park. It was slated to open with the park on April 8th, heating the water to 80 degrees to make up for the cold weather, but a rainy spring delayed construction. PR manager Ruth Voss said it was the first time in 18 years they hadn't been able to open a major attraction with the park. Rain wasn't their only problem going into 1989. Animal rights activists accused the park of mistreating the animals in the wild animal habitat, their main charge around the chaining of elephants, one of which died. Their allegations came in part from a zookeeper who was fired from the park. Kings Island responded, claiming they weren't doing anything out of the ordinary, confirming an elephant did die, but the autopsy showed it was from natural causes. The U.S. Department of Agriculture launched an investigation shortly after. Waterworks opened two weeks into the season, included with a 1995 admission to the park. Timberwolf played host to Dick Clark's American Bandstand Tour, Rick Astley, The Bangles, Jefferson Airplane, and many more. The Ninja Turtles made an appearance at the International Showplace, along with five new stage shows for the season. 1989 would also be the last season for Der Spin and Kagers, one of the park's original rides. For the next season, they announced a new million dollar inner tube ride for Waterworks, later named Giant Rushing River, and for Kings Island, a two million dollar flat ride called Flight Commander. This would be a 20 pod spinning ride, taking two passengers 60 feet up in the air, and the pod can be maneuvered to dip, rise, and perform barrel rolls. The park was hoping to capitalize on an amazing year, bringing in 3.16 million guests. Waterworks was only expected to bring in 300,000 in its first year. They ended up with over 1 million. Kings Island was flying high going into the 90s, booking concerts like Tears for Fears, The Isley Brothers, and Tommy Page, raising a mission to 2095 and parking to 350. But they were met with an extended spell of bad weather, and that kept the crowds away into the early summer. But the weather improved. People flocked in to ride the new additions in the water park and the dry park. And by the end of summer, they were approaching yet another record. When asked what the secret was behind these record-setting years, Carolyn Boos replied, New thrills. Kings Island planned on keeping that train rolling right into the next year, announcing Adventure Express, a $4 million coaster designed to resemble a runaway train at an old mining camp. Built by Aerodynamics, this would travel over 3,000 feet of track, go through tunnels, and encounter characters and special effects. It was a ride aimed at families and younger kids, and it was a stark contrast to the new coasters being added around them. Two years after opening the world's tallest coaster, Cedar Point was going for another record, the world's tallest wooden coaster. The company behind the $7.5 million monstrosity was the Din Corporation, led by Charles Din. Kings Island's former director of construction, maintenance, and engineering left the park in 1983 to start his own firm, and the man behind the beast was now going even bigger across the state. Other Kings Entertainment Parks were building major thrill rides, including Anaconda at Kings Dominion and Vortex at Canada's Wonderland, both also coming from Aerodynamics. Many parks already had these runaway mine train coasters from Aero, going back to the 60s and 70s. In August, 19 people were injured when their Huss Enterprise, Skylab, came to an unexpected halt. Nobody was seriously hurt, but the ride was closed for inspection. Nothing would happen to Skylab, but the Ferris wheel and Flying Dutchman were retired after the season. 1991 presented a slew of challenges for Kings Island, some of which were out of their control. First, the economy started to weaken, so people had less money to spend at the park. At the same time, the market for live performances was hot, with performers asking for top dollar to make appearances. Kings Island once again raised the prices to accommodate this, now $22.95, and in-park concert tickets were now $8. Adventure Express opened on time, its signature element being the tunnel full of animatronic drummers, beating away at their drums on either side of the train. If Indiana Jones ever settles down and has kids, he could take them on Kings Island's new Adventure Express and not worry about nightmares haunting their sleep. Connie Yeager, Cincinnati Post. Right when Kings Island opened full-time for the 1991 season, the park had a day so tragic it was impossible to forget. Something so surreal, it could only come out of a nightmare. On the evening of June 9th, Tim Binning fell into a pond near the beer garden. He recalls something pulling him down into the water, and then he hit a metal bar that shocked him several times. This would burn his arm and his neck, his friend William Heathcote saw what happened and dove in after him. Park employee Daryl Robertson was soon to follow. The three were pulled out of the water. Binning survived. Heathcote and Robertson did not. Heathcote died instantly from cardiac arrest from the electrical shocks. Robertson's official cause of death was drowning. 
having been knocked unconscious by the shock, inhaling and ingesting water before his death. Less than one hour later, a woman fell from the new flight commander riot and was killed. Witnesses saw her capsule rotate, and she slid to the empty seat and entirely out of the capsule, falling 30 feet into the tree-lined area. Two unspeakable accidents, three deaths, all within one hour. Investigators found four electrical hazards that caused the pond to be dangerous. They found the pond aerator was installed with the park back in 1971, and that predated some stricter regulations passed in 1981. The park didn't violate any laws, but the device was not up to modern codes. OSHA found seven safety violations and fined the park $23,500. Kings Island reconciled this issue by installing circuit interrupters all over the park, designed to shut off power if they detect electricity escaping into undesignated areas. These devices only cost between $15 and $50. As OSHA's William Murphy said, they could have spent the price of a discount ticket and the people would be alive today. A simple device could have saved some lives in this case. The 32-year-old victim of the flight commander accident was found to have an alcohol level of 0.30 three times the level set by the state of Ohio to consider a person legally drunk. This launched an investigation into the park's alcohol service practice, but they couldn't prove any laws regarding over-serving a person were broken. Her condition was ruled a factor in her death, but in the end, the accident was blamed on a design flaw in the restraints. Riders were able to move horizontally and out of the restraints, a problem made worse without a second person in the capsule. Flight Commander was partially dismantled as the park entered talks with Intamin to modify it, and by the end of the summer, it was clear they were aiming to reopen the ride. By the opening of the 1992 season, the ride added a dividing wall between the seats, lengthened the sides of the lap bar so it came closer to the dividing wall and the side of the capsule, and the ride-ups would start closing the restraints of the empty seats. There would be an $8 million lawsuit filed against Intamin in 1993, and Kings Island settled with a family for about $336,000. Adding to the park's problems in 1991, a funnel cloud hit the park in August, causing some damage to waterworks. Nobody was in the area of the water park when it happened, and the rest of the park remained open. By the end of the year, the park gave a farewell to the Smurfs Enchanted Voyage, set to replace it with the Phantom Theater, a $3.5 million haunted dark ride. The area would also be home to a new 500-seat indoor children's theater, called Enchanted Theater. There would also be three new kids' rides, including a small miler coaster called Scooby Zoom. For Kings Island's 20th anniversary, the park was looking for a rebound. Attendance stepped well below the 3 million mark, down 11% from 1990. With the help of Mean Streak, it was the first time in three years that Cedar Point beat Kings Island in attendance. One aspect of the Kings Island complex that would not rebound was the College Football Hall of Fame. When Taft brought the facility to Warren County back in 1978, they were hoping for 300,000 visitors every year. They wound up with about 10% of that number. In January, the hall closed for good and sought to reopen in South Bend, Indiana. Once the park opened for the 1992 season, the Phantom Theater got rave reviews. It was rated as one of the top new rides of the year by Family Fun Magazine, described as a Disneyland-style attraction, four and a half minutes long with 38 animated figures and other sensory effects. Timberwolf also booked major acts, like Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, Hammer, the Beach Boys, and others. Right as the park seemed to be getting back on track, a shockwave was sent through the industry. For over 80 years, Paramount has taken you on a roller coaster of action, adventure, and entertainment. Now, Paramount is about to take you beyond the limits of the motion picture screen to the next generation of excitement, where the magic of the movies meets the thrills of a lifetime. Get ready for Paramount's King's Island, opening April 9th, weekends beginning April 10th. In late July 1992, Paramount Communications agreed to acquire Kings Island and the Kings Entertainment Parks for $400 million. Kings Island's owner, Carl Linder, was set to receive $200 million in the deal. He agreed to the sale once Paramount agreed to make no major changes in operations that would affect current management. This was coming on the heels of Linder ending the contract with Kings Entertainment to manage the park. Linder denied the explanations that the sale was due to the 11% attendance slide. Rather, they were investors, and this was a deal that was too good to pass up. Nelson Schwab III of the King's Entertainment Company saw things a little different. He believed the industry was turning towards lower cost rides with theme-oriented material. He felt like Paramount had the branding to make this happen, with products like Indiana Jones, Star Trek, and more. He said this was needed for the park to take that next quantum leap. After the sale, they would be in position to update our long-range plans for the park with Paramount products. Schwab was able to get Paramount to acquire the King's Entertainment Company first, and then suggested they go after King's Island as well. Paramount agreed. With the sale, Paramount became the fourth largest park operator in the nation, just behind Disney, Anheuser-Busch, and Time Warner, who owned Six Flags at the time. Paramount would bring Schwab on board as a chairman and CEO of their brand new theme park subsidiary, Paramount Parks. Kings Island would also name a new executive vice president and general manager, Alexander Weber Jr. 
he was coming over from Great America in Santa Clara, California, where he held the same position. Following the sale, Paramount was granted rights to the Hanna-Barbera characters through 2009, but they were still expected to do a massive rebranding, promoting their more popular products. This was expected to be done before any new major rides were added, but right away, Paramount proved they could do both. In November, Kings Island announced Top Gun, a $5 million suspended coaster from Aerodynamics, themed to the Tom Cruise film from 1986. The Aero suspended coaster was making a comeback to Kings Island, 10 years after the back closed because of design flaws. The park emphasized the technology around this model had been tried and improved since then, including Vortex at their sister park, Canada's Wonderland, having been open since 1991. Alexander Weber said, Top Gun is the first of many movie-themed products that Paramount will add to the park, but Paramount giveth and Paramount taketh away. Winterfest 1992 was announced to be the park's last, ending an 11-year run, as Paramount wanted to concentrate on the park's primary operating season, adding weekends in October to the calendar. As guests entered the turnstiles for the 1993 season, they were entering a whole new King's Island. The American Heritage Music Hall was now called the Paramount Theater. Paramount on Ice was a new skating show, featuring music from movies like An Officer and a Gentleman, Star Trek, Grease, and Footloose. The Tower Gardens was turned into the Paramount story, highlighting the studio's popular films. Characters from Paramount movies, like Star Trek and the Coneheads, would join the Hanna-Barbera characters. There would also be an exhibit of Star Trek memorabilia for two weeks in June. A new ad campaign was launched, Paramount's King's Island, where the magic of the movies meets the thrills of a lifetime. Admission was bumped up a dollar to $23.95. Top Gun opened with the park for the 1993 season and got great reviews. The only complaint seemed to be that it was too short, lasting about a minute and a half and covering 2,352 feet of track. However, Kings Island veteran Don Helbig, making the news for riding the racer 10,000 times and having ridden suspended coasters all over the country, said this was the best one he's been on, far and away. While Paramount clearly had their sights on new rides and shows, they had little interest in maintaining wildlife. At the end of the 1993 season, the park announced the wild animal habitat would be shut down immediately. They would work on finding new homes for the exotic animals that were not native to Ohio, having 300 animals total. Meanwhile, Paramount was planning the next big ride, Days of Thunder, a motion simulator ride, featuring scenes from the 1990 Tom Cruise film of the same name. This was a new theater that could be repurposed for other shows in the future. Later in the year, Paramount announced a deal to merge with Viacom, the parent of Nickelodeon and MTV. Viacom would pay $10 billion to buy Paramount, and this would open up even more branding opportunities for the Paramount Parks. And Viacom assured the public the Paramount Parks would not be sold. With everything changing, the axe rolling into Timberwolf remained. 1993 featured the Beach Boys, the Doobie Brothers, and ex-Eagles Glenn Frey and Joe Walsh. In 1994, former Kings Island seasonal employee Jane Cooper was named president of Paramount Parks, taking the spot of Nelson Schwab III, having concocted the Paramount takeover and looking for a new challenge. Days of Thunder was a big hit as the major new ride, and there were several new shows, including Game On, a new interactive game show in the Fest House, where guests could take part in slapstick contests and win prizes. Timberwolf introduced a new tiered pricing system, where the kids' shows cost $3, acts like the B-52s and Hank Williams Jr. were $5, and the Blues Fest featuring B.B. King and Natalie Cole would run you $10. Paramount Parks did not waste any time taking advantage of the Viacom branding, announcing the Nickelodeon Splat City for 1995, a new themed area with fountains of green slime. This would include all kinds of games and activities, most of which coded its participant in slime. They would also use their MTV brand to bring two of the network's most popular shows to King's Island, Singled Out and The Grind. More interactive entertainment for the guests. The crowd responded to Kings Island's new identity, bringing in a record 3.3 million guests. Nickelodeon Splat City was not the only thing new for 1995. Kings Island also introduced Drop Zone. Inspired by the 1994 film starring Wesley Snipes, this would be a 170-foot sky coaster. This would not be included with the price of admission, with guests having to pay between $14.95 to $24.95, depending if they were riding solo or riding with one or two others. Riders are strapped into full-body flight harnesses, lifted to the max height, then pulls on the ripcord and into a freefall, swooping over the ground at 60 miles per hour. Timberwolf also brought in some new acts, one being the Highwaymen. This was a group made up of Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, Chris Christopherson, and Johnny Cash. They also mixed it up with TLC, REO Speedwagon, Pat Benatar, and Fleetwood Mac. In the summer of 1995, Kings Island asked to be annexed into the city of Mason. Currently part of Deerfield Township, officials thought it was in the best interest of the park to be part of Mason, being able to take advantage of all the services they offer. This would spark a long battle between the park, the city of Mason, and Deerfield Township that would last for years. Including Mason seceding from Deerfield Township, Kings Island trying to change sides to remain in Deerfield Township. 
the Ohio Supreme Court rejecting Deerfield Township's appeal, followed by Mason annexing most of the park in 1997, except for a small part to appease Deerfield Township. And by 1999, the park was entirely in Mason. 1995 would be the final season for Flight Commander, serving four more seasons after its fatal accident, as well as Scrappy Slides, a Coney Island original that opened in the Coney Mollus flying carpet, but was moved to Hanna-Barbera Land in 1986. By the end of the summer, Paramount was ready to roll out the next big coaster for the park, this one with a dark twist. Remember years ago when you were afraid, frightened, terrified of the dark. Welcome back. Prepare yourself for the outer limits flight of fear. The scariest, darkest, most twisted roller coaster ever. Face your fears only at Paramount's Kings Island. Themed after the 1960s science fiction TV series, the new Premier Rides coaster would be called the Outer Limits Flight of Fear. Located entirely indoors and mostly in the dark with some special effects, the coaster would be the first to use linear induction motors to launch the train, reaching speeds of 53 miles per hour and traversing four inversions. The ride building would only take up one acre of land, so the track would be very compact. The VP of Construction and Maintenance called this the most ambitious undertaking in the history of the park. As the ride was under construction, 20-year-old worker John Reeves fell off the roof, plunging 110 feet. Amazingly, he survived, and he even tried to stand up before someone told him to stay down. He broke his hip, pelvic bone, both heels, his left femur, and crushed his right foot. Flight of Fear would not be ready to open with the park in April, but the other new attraction would be. This was Excess Raceway, a 665-foot oval bank go-kart track. Just like Drop Zone, renamed Extreme Sky Flyer for the 1996 season, Excess Raceway was not included in the price of admission. It would cost $5 per driver, $2.50 per passenger. The park initially thought Flight of Fear could open in late May, and that quickly turned into mid-June. Park officials said it was the longest and most complicated project they'd ever done, and blamed the unprecedented technology on the delay. On June 18th, it finally rolled out to the park's biggest thrill seekers. One early writer said, The launch was something you can experience only if you're a fighter pilot. It plasters your jaws against the back of the seat. Another said, It's that initial pop, that launch, then it never lets up. General Manager Alexander Weber Jr. added, It's more than just a new ride. It's the most innovative themed ride experience available anywhere today. Adding to the ride experience was the brand new QTV, a set of TV screens located inside the ride's queue, telling the riders they were part of a government teleconference and an alien spacecraft has landed and was being studied by scientists. The riders enter a hangar with a glowing saucer, and when they prepare to enter the spaceship, the aliens take over. It's a 15 minute setup, meant not only to pass along queue times, but also to provide the most integrated ride experience in the park. QTV was a big part of the new Outer Limits Flight of Fear, but it was incorporated into the rest of the park also. About 200 video monitors were placed in ride lines, picnic groves, and restaurants, providing everything from entertainment to advertisements to general park information. Following a year with one of the world's most innovative coasters, Kings Island focused on their water park for the 1997 season. Waterworks would receive a massive expansion, doubling its 15 acres to 30, including a children's water area and a 31,000 square foot, 600,000 gallon heated wave pool. The park's 25th season would open with the admission price topping $30, a price that people would be willing to pay given its lofty status. The National Amusement Park Historical Association held a survey, and Kings Island ranked fourth in the list of best parks, trailing Disneyland, Busch Gardens Williamsburg, and Walt Disney World. And it was also voted the third most beautiful park, just behind Busch Gardens Williamsburg and Alton Towers. Alexander Weber would be promoted to COO of Paramount Parks, and his position as general manager would be filled by Tim Fisher. The park would throw a kid's Hallow Fest for Halloween, with special activities in the Fest House and Hanna-Barbera Land, which was also announced for an expansion the next season. The major addition would be Scooby's Ghoster Coaster, a suspended kids ride unique to America, described as a cross between hang gliding and a traditional coaster, with two riders per car sitting one in front of the other, rising up a 40-foot elevator lift, and then swooping through a 450-foot course. For Waterworks, the park announced Wipeout Beach, a bodyboard surfing attraction. The park had to say goodbye to their antique cars, the Ohio Overland Auto Library, this closed after the 1997 season, but it wouldn't be removed for several more years. The park also bid farewell to their Huss Enterprise, Skylab. Days of Thunder also ran its course, being reprogrammed at James Bond, 007, a license to thrill. This would be joined by the new Backlot Stunt Show and a new rock wall called The Edge, another upcharge attraction. Two years removed from their last major thrill coaster, Kings Island was ready for their next. This would be themed to the 1997 John Travolta Nicolas Cage film Face Off of a coma inverted boomerang. True to its name, it would have riders facing each other as the train rises up 131 feet forward and backward, with three inversions in between. They would also install a 315-foot Intamin Gyro Drop Ride. This would be called Drop Zone Stunt Tower, using the same theme the Extreme Skyflyer opened with in 1995. 
1999 would also bring a new name for the XS Raceway. The park again, reusing a former theme and going with Days of Thunder. Amazon Falls would now be called Congo Falls, themed to the 1995 film. This would be part of an expansion and retheme of the Adventure Village, formerly the Wild Animal Habitat, now to be known as the Action Zone. This transformed the former safari area into a Hollywood backlot. There would be a 40-foot replica of the Paramount Studios Water Tower, with new shows from the Paramount Action Stunt Team. Also bringing the entertainment would be teenage superstar Britney Spears, coming to Timberwolf in August, as well as Star Trek Earth Tour, another two-week exhibit of models, costumes, and memorabilia. Kings Island said 1999 was the year with the most capital investments ever, but there were nothing but problems that arose that were out of the park's control. First, Drop Zone was hit by lightning, closing the ride for about a day. Less than a month later, the ride was shut down following an accident at Paramount's Great America in California. A boy fell to his death on a similar ride there, having slipped out of his harness, and Kings Island decided to install a seatbelt to connect the seat with the restraint. The same week as the Drop Zone closure, King Cobra had to shut down following a fatality on Shockwave at Paramount's King's Dominion both stand-up coasters manufactured by Togo. Once it was determined the victim was not following safety rules, both parks reopened their coasters after just a couple days. Although neither of these accidents occurred at Kings Island, it sparked the conversation once again about theme park safety. State Senator Mark Mallory announced his plans to review laws governing inspection of rides. Ohio and Florida were the only states to employ full-time inspectors, giving licenses and conducting twice-a-year inspections. This also sparked the push for federal oversight, and that started to gain steam near the end of 1999. The questions over ride safety only intensified as the rides continued to get bigger and faster. The coaster revolution that Magnum XL200 started 10 years prior had reached a whole new level. On July 22, 1999, Cedar Point would stun the coaster world with the announcement of Millennium Force, the world's first 300-foot coaster. But Kings Island would not be left behind. Paramount had something big in store for the park, and in many ways, it was more extreme and ambitious than the 300-footer. And it was, without a doubt, the worst decision in Kings Island's 50-year history. With 34 new roller coasters looming on the horizon across the United States, there is a veritable buffet of roller coaster treats. That's the most new roller coasters to appear in a single year since the Depression in the US. We're in the midst of a full-blown coaster renaissance. unleash on the world something that we can call the sequel to the beast. This is the son of beast. There was no doubt about it. As the 20th century was coming to an end, the coaster wars were as hot as they've ever been. Six Flags was adding not one, not two, not three, but four new coasters to the former Geauga Lake in upstate Ohio, freshly rebranded as Six Flags Ohio. Six Flags was adding over 20 new coasters chain-wide for the year 2000, echoing what they did in 1999. This included the 255-foot Goliath at Six Flags Magic Mountain, and that would hold the record for the world's tallest drop for a grand total of three months, before Cedar Point opened up the 300-foot Millennium Force. That record would fall three months later, thanks to Steel Dragon 2000 in Japan. Kings Island wasn't aiming for the world's tallest coaster, but they were aiming to destroy all the major wooden coaster records. They did it once before with a beast 20 years prior, and the Beast's progeny, as the Cincinnati Post Connie Yeager put it, was Paramount's Kings Island's year 2000 offensive in the high stakes coaster wars. Its father spread pandemonium throughout the Midwest. Its arrival will thrill a nation. Its legacy is destined to change the world. Presenting Son of the Beast, the world's tallest, fastest, only looping wooden roller coaster. Son of Beast, only at Kings Island. The Son of Beast would not only be the world's tallest wooden coaster, standing 218 feet with a 214 foot drop, and not only would it be the world's fastest wooden coaster, topping out at 78 miles per hour, it would be the first wooden coaster to go upside down with a massive 118 foot vertical loop. There was one record that the Son wouldn't take, and that was the record for length, still owned by the father. It wouldn't be that far off though. It would clear 7,000 feet, sprawling over 12 acres of land, Upon its announcement, General Manager Tim Fisher said, Son of Beast will be THE Millennium Coaster. It will stand as a monumental symbol of Paramount's Kings Island's commitment to quality and world-class rides and entertainment. This $20 million coaster would be located near Top Gun, heading out into an undeveloped area of the park, formerly the Wild Animal Habitat. 
It would be manufactured by the Roller Coaster Corporation of America, a company that built its first coaster at Fiesta, Texas in 1992 with the Rattler, and they had a few projects opening around the world in 1999 and 2000. For such a massive project, track was already vertical by the spring of 1999. By the dawn of the new millennium, Son of Beast had its first problem. In January, a 50 by 100 foot part of the structure fell over, blamed on high winds. Some workers had also complained about the safety conditions on the project, and that got OSHA to come out to investigate. They slapped a $110,000 fine for 18 violations, mainly around the lack of fall protection systems, and the failure to determine if temporary bracing was strong enough to withstand high winds. The park was cooperative in addressing these measures, implementing new site-specific rules due to the complexity of building Son of Beast. When the park opened in mid-April, there was a lot to be excited about. There was a new upcharge attraction, Flight Team. This was a helicopter ride, taking riders up and giving them an aerial tour of the park. And if you paid more, you could get a tour of Cincinnati or Dayton, with a custom tour possible for an additional fee. This would cost between $25 and $155. There were also 10 new shows for kids and adults. Timberwolf has some big acts lined up, like Sugar Ray, Smash Mouth, Chicago, Weird Al Yankovic, Duran Duran, and Martina McBride. There was also a new direct entrance to Waterworks, allowing guests to get in from the parking lot and avoiding the dry park. The one thing they weren't looking forward to was Son of Beast. Construction delays pushed his opening back. Two weeks later, Son of Beast was finally set to open its gates. Two hours into its opening day, maintenance was still trying to get it ready for prime time, with the lines stretching throughout the park. Once they got it working, it got rave reviews. Don Helbig, the record holder for the most rides on the racer with over 11,000 to that point, said Son of Beast exceeded his expectation. There's no lull. It's non-stop action and speed. After that opening Friday, Son of Beast opened for some time on Saturday, but it was shut down for the rest of the weekend. There was a 15-foot section of track at the top of the second hill that needed adjustments. They planned on reopening it the next week, but that didn't happen. The park was hoping to get it open the week after, but that deadline came and went. Finally, almost a month after its opening day, Son of Beast was back open to the public. 7,000 riders lined up to ride it on its reopening day. Other than some minor mishaps in June, Son of Beast remained operational for the rest of the season. But by the end of the year, Kings Island filed a lawsuit against three companies involved in building the coaster. One was the Roller Coaster Corporation of America, hired to design and build the ride. Another was Wooden Structures Incorporated, hired as the lead structural engineer. Finally, Universal Forest Products of Hamilton provided the lumber. Kings Island alleged that shoddy design and construction forced the ride's month-long closure. Once the 2000 season got underway, Kings Island launched the month-long Dinosaurs, a prehistoric journey, a kids exhibit featuring 13 dinosaurs and interactive stations. They also had been hosting the kid-friendly Howl's Scream up to that point. But in 2000, they would launch Fear Fest, a much more dark and terrifying event transforming different areas of the park into sinister destinations. Despite all the action and all the new additions, capping off their $40 million two-year expansion between 1999 and 2000, attendance dropped for the second straight year, down 4% to about 3.2 million. The park blamed this not on Son of Beast, but on bad weather. For the 2001 season, the park would focus on the kids, expanding the Nickelodeon Splat Zone into Nickelodeon Central and adding three new rides. This included a retheme of the King's Mills Log Flume to the Wild Thornberry's River Adventure and Rugrats Runaway Reptar, a Vacoma suspended family coaster. Kenton's Cove Keelboat Canal never got to see the 2001 season, removed for something big the park had planned for the future. Outer Limits Flight of Fear would drop the Outer Limits from its name, as well as dropping its over-the-shoulder restraints, replacing them with much more open lap bars. James Bond, a license to thrill, was retired from the newly renamed Action Theater, replaced by Stan Lee's Seventh Portal and Smash Factory and would start being used to host films during the Halloween season. 2001 was also the first year the park would offer a gold pass, offering a free upgrade for families buying their pass in April. This would give access to some rides an hour before the rest of the public, two for deals on Tuesdays where guests could ride twice without getting back in line, and access to preferred parking. The park brought in more family-friendly entertainment, like the Mapapa Acrobats and Forbidden Magic, Secrets of the Mummy's Tomb, a magic show in the Paramount Theater. Timberwolf was set to feature Jessica Simpson, Aaron Carter, and the Spirit Song Festival, as Kings Island continued to be a popular spot for Christian music acts. Son of Beast had a smoother sophomore season, giving its one millionth ride in June. 2001 was a big rebound year for Kings Island, with attendance back up 4% to 3.36 million, crediting the success of the Gold Pass and the new Nickelodeon Central. The park had conducted surveys to see what people wanted. They wanted more family-oriented attractions. The park listened, and they were rewarded. Kings Island would win Amusement Today's Golden Ticket Award for Best Kids Area in 2001, and they would win it every single year for the next 18 years. Even with a sagging economy and travel fears following the September 11th terrorist attacks, Kings Island, as a regional park, did not suffer as much as the big destinations. Looking to add to their most popular park on their 30th anniversary, Paramount used its hottest brand for a brand new thrill ride. 
Tomb Raider The Ride, based on the popular Angelina Jolie film. This would be a heavily themed, totally immersive dark ride experience. The show building would be located next to the Beast in the Rivertown area, on the former site of Kenton's Cove Keelboat Canal. The whole experience would start with a queue line, where patrons would enter the cursed tomb and be sealed inside. Everything from this point on would play off scenes from the movie. As park spokesman Jeffrey Siebert said, There is nothing like this in the entire world. The infrastructure of this ride is unparalleled to anything Paramount Parks has done to date. The ride was a husk giant topspin, flipping riders around in the darkness, equipped with fog and light effects, lifting riders up to stare at sharp, icy stalactites on the ceiling, then dropping the riders and dangle them over a supposed lava pit. This would use fountains to shoot wider near their faces. Tomb Raider would coincide with a $2 hike in the admission price, up to $42 for a single day, and the adult gold pass was selling for $84.99. This would not include a ride on the brand new Slingshot, a fun time bungee ride that would launch riders 275 feet in the air at speeds of 100 miles per hour, flipping the whole time. This would open as an upcharge attraction. The 2002 season also started without its oldest steel coaster, King Cobra. Once its manufacturer, Togo, went out of business in America, parts were harder to come by and maintenance became more difficult. It served the park for 18 seasons. 2002 was also the first year for new general manager Craig Ross, replacing Tim Fisher. Ross was Kings Island's vice president of resale in 1995, before moving on to the same role for the entire Paramount Parks chain. He oversaw some big changes following the 2002 season, starting with the retheme of the popular Phantom Theater that served 11 years. This would be called Scooby-Doo and the Haunted Castle, a multi-million dollar overhaul that was billed as the first interactive family ride in the park's history. A four and a half minute ride where guests board mystery machine vehicles, equipped with fright lights, they can shoot at targets along the ride and collect points, adding them up at the end to see who won. SpongeBob SquarePants 3D would start its long run at the Action Theater also, but the biggest addition of 2003 would be Delirium. Kings Island employing Huss a year after installing Tomb Raider to build a giant frisbee, the first of its kind in the world. This would raise riders 137 feet off the ground in a swinging motion like a pendulum, following a 120 degree arc, all while spinning. This would be on the plot of land that King Cobra left open. Craig Ross also oversaw the addition of metal detectors, something that had become more and more common after the September 11th terror attacks, and Ross wanted to make it a point going into his first full year. We are constantly evaluating and enhancing our safety and security measures. As a part of this process, and in conjunction with world events, we are implementing this system as one more tool to ensure the safety of both our guests and associates. The process would also include a bag check for the first time. In order not to hinder the guests trying to enter the park, they installed 30 metal detectors, outnumbering the amount of turnstiles. In addition to the new rides, the park also debuted the Tomb Raider stunt show in honor of the 2003 Tomb Raider sequel, The Cradle of Life. Timberwolf also welcomed in Def Leppard, Aaron Carter, Billy Idol, and Third Eye Blind. In late September, a severe storm with over 100 mile per hour winds caused major damage to Warren and Hamilton counties and destroyed the Paramount's Kings Island sign, collapsing in the parking lot. Kings Island stopped offering the helicopter rides after the 2003 season, but they were about to bring a whole new experience for the water park. Waterworks opened in 1989, had a major expansion in 1997, and now it was being retired in favor of a major new water park resort. Craig Ross explained, If you crave innovative water adventures, or if you simply prefer to relax and be pampered all day, the new water park resort will have something for everyone. This would be called Crocodile Dundee's Boomerang Bay, sporting an Australian theme, and featured four new attractions for 2004. This included the Tasmanian Typhoon, the raft slide with a giant funnel at the end of a 269-foot tunnel. The park even got Crocodile Dundee himself, Paul Hogan, to promote the new water park. The problem was, Warren County was expanding rapidly and were having problems with the water supply. Kings Island's request for an extra 500,000 gallons per day was met with skepticism, but they figured it out and got it done, and Crocodile Dundee's Boomerang Bay opened on schedule in late May. Kings Island also launched a new event for teenagers, Extended Play Fridays. From 8 p.m. to midnight in the Action Zone, anyone 16 and older could enter for $5 and dance and party with guest DJs. For kids, they rolled out the Nickelodeon Celebration Parade, with 80 performers, 6 floats, and encouraging guest participation. For everyone, the Paramount Theater got a $1 million renovation and a new show. Paramount's Magic of the Movies Live, including brand new theater seats and a new digital projection system. Park guests would even be chosen to recreate scenes from movies like Titanic and Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> my, my favorite's still the um, King's Island, The Beast. Mm. I presented a paper at an entomology convention in Cincinnati just so I could ride Son of Beast. Head over heels on a wooden track. 2004 was a big success, with the park bringing in 3.5 million guests, a 7% increase from 2003. Looking ahead toward a major addition for 2005, the park closed two classic rides. One of them was Flying Eagles, 
formerly known as Flying Scooters, a Coney Island original. The other was Less Taxis, the antique cars that opened with the park. They also took this opportunity to remove the Ohio Overland Auto Library, standing but not operating for seven years. Kings Island would use this land for their brand new coaster, the well-themed Premier Rides launch coaster, the Italian Job stunt track. This was based on the 2003 Mark Wahlberg film, The Italian Job, with the cars resembling BMW Mini Coopers, recreating climactic chase scenes from the movie, equipped with special effects throughout the ride. Kings Island would also have interest outside its gates, closing its campground and announcing its replacement, a joint venture with the Great Wolf Resorts for a $100 million project, a 39-acre family resort and entertainment complex. This would include a massive 404 suite resort, an indoor water park, and a conference center, among other attractions. There would be shuttles and trams taking guests from the lodge to the park and back. This was another step in turning Kings Island into a year-round destination and getting people to stay multiple days at the complex in the summer. This was set to open the following year. Meanwhile, there were rumblings at the top. Viacom was rumored to split into two companies, built around its main TV properties, CBS and MTV. This led to uncertainty about the future ownership of the park, a park that saw 3.3 million visitors in 2005, down 5% from the year prior. This was despite the return of Winterfest, the event that Paramount got rid of right after buying the park in 1992. Bill Balfour, Kings Island's manager of entertainment and special effects, said, the original Winterfest opened small and kept growing. Winterfest is going to be more impressive when it opens than it was when it closed last time. The most popular attraction was the ice skating rink on International Street, so they brought that back and decked out the entire front of the park with brand new decorations and lights. This was joined by parades, shows, special dining and retail options, and the signature attraction was the White Christmas Express, using the railroad for a show experience. This was about a soldier coming home after World War II. One of 2005's casualties was smoking in the park, it would only be permitted in designated zones. But the park also lost Scooby's Ghoster Coaster, replaced by a Zamperla Skater Coaster, Avatar The Last Airbender. This would be one of six new rides for their kids' area, being totally revamped. Nickelodeon Central and Hanna-Barbera Land would be renamed Nickelodeon Universe, with the Hanna-Barbera-themed rides receiving Nickelodeon themes. This included the family wooden coaster Beastie, now with the name Fairly Odd Coaster, and their smallest coaster, Scooby Zoom, renamed Top Cat's Taxi Jam in 1998, would now be called Little Bill's Giggle Coaster. The world's greatest kids area would become even more spectacular in 2006. Over the summer of 2005, it was clear that Viacom was going to split into two, and by the end of the year, it was done. Paramount Parks fell under the umbrella of CBS, and they immediately decided to put the chain up for sale. Because the theme park industry had matured and stabilized, the days of double-digit increases in revenue were gone. The industry was lucky to see 2 or 3% growth each year. With slow growth and high capital costs, these parks didn't do much to boost stock prices. If CBS was going to invest in theme parks, it would be in the fast-growing Asian market, not America. The news drew immediate interest from several parties in January 2006, including some private equity funds, Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, owner of the Busch Gardens and SeaWorld Parks, and Cedar Fair, who owns six parks nationwide. The sale would put all the parks' branding in jeopardy, including all of the Paramount movies like Top Gun, Tomb Raider, and The Italian Job but also Nickelodeon, with Nickelodeon Universe taking shape as the sale was being negotiated. On Monday, May 22, 2006, a deal was struck. In a $1.24 billion cash deal, Cedar Fair was the big-time winner of the five Paramount Parks, plus the rights to operate Bonfante Gardens in California. For Paramount Parks, Cedar Fair was a good suitor because of their history of operating major parks, including Ohio Cedar Point and Geauga Lake. Cedar Fair was interested because this would double their portfolio with large-scale, well-established parks, and they would gain a more national presence. The deal was expected to close in the third quarter of 2006, and Cedar Fair assured guests they would not notice any differences in operation for the new season. However, by midsummer, Cedar Fair announced that Winterfest had been tabled and would not happen in 2006. The one year the event came back, attendance was below expected levels. When asked if Winterfest would ever come back, the park's response was, we never say never. Despite the demise of Winterfest, Fearfest would remain. Cedar Fair may have been happy with their investment as a whole, but they were about to inherit one giant problem. It seemed like a typical midsummer Sunday evening. A train full of riders on Son of Beast was dispatched, and about halfway through the ride, they felt a sudden jolt. This was in one of the large helices, the one known as the Rose Bowl. One rider said, It felt like we hit something or jumped the track. Everyone was screaming before that. Then, it was complete silence the rest of the ride. A witness said he saw people being carried away on stretchers. Others were bleeding from their mouths and hunched over in pain. 27 people were sent to the hospital, most with minor chest and neck injuries, and all but two were released the same day. 
when that train came back with the injured riders. The next train was stopped on the lift hill and the ride was shut down. The state came in to inspect the ride the day after, and they believe the accident was caused by a crack beam that caused a dip in the track. This led to a lawsuit by the end of the month, filed by one of the riders who fractured her sternum, stayed at the hospital for four days, and couldn't return to work for eight weeks. Son of Beast would remain closed for the rest of the season, as the park and Cedar Fair had to decide what to do. They concluded the structure was not meant to bear the ride's weight, and they could remedy this by using lighter trains. They bought the trains from the recently defunct Hurricane Category 5 from the Myrtle Beach Pavilion, manufactured by Gerstlauer. These were much lighter than the original, and they would cause less stress on the track and the supports. There was just one problem. The lighter trains wouldn't gain enough speed to complete the vertical loop, and the ride signature element had to be removed. The state also said the park had to make other structural changes, including adding metal supports to make the structure more resistant to stress. After giving Son of Beast another chance, Cedar Fair was busy rebranding the park ahead of the 2007 season. All references to Paramount were removed, and the park went back to its original name, Kings Island. The one thing that didn't change right away was the roadside marquee, the one that was just replaced after collapsing in the 2003 windstorm. The park said that would eventually be swapped out. As for new additions, there were five new live shows, including the Endless Summer on Ice, the first ice skating show in 12 years, as well as a roller coaster that was new to the park, but not new to the state of Ohio. Firehawk was a Vacoma Flying Dutchman, located right next to Flight of Fear in the new x space section of the park an area themed to a secret military base. This operated at Yaga Lake from 2001 to 2006, and Cedar Fair decided it would be better off with their new acquisition, and led to a lot of speculation about that park's future. Later that year, Cedar Fair would announce the closure of the Giaga Lake theme park, leaving just the water park behind. Since moving the Bavarian Beetle to the park in its opening year, Firehawk would be the first relocated coaster to come to Kings Island. There was also excitement around, not a new coaster, but a coaster given new life. Son of Beast reopened on the 4th of July, five days shy of a full year being shut down, operating with trains that were one-third lighter than the original. Craig Ross said, It's still really good. We even had some people clapping and cheering in the station. But while Son of Beast was reopened, another ride in the action zone was shut down. This was Drop Zone, closed down ever since a teenager's feet were severed on a similar ride in late June. The ride at Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom was also built by Intamin, so the closure was out of an abundance of caution. It reopened after about a month, once it was determined that the cables that snapped in Kentucky were not a hazard at Kings Island. By the end of the year, Kings Island was ready to roll out the revamped Halloween event called Halloween Haunt, replacing Fear Fest. The biggest new addition was Club Blood, a new venue full of vampires looking to repopulate. There would be nearly 400 live characters, double the number from the year prior, and Halloween Haunt would be more intense, relentless, and gory, according to the park's new spokesman, Don Helbig. The Cincinnati native that was known for riding the racer almost 12,000 times and seemed to be at all the park's major events was now part of the team, and he remains there to this day. When Cedar Fair bought the Paramount Parks, it included a deal to keep the Paramount name in front of the parks, as well as the Paramount branding for 10 years. They chose to rename the parks right away, but didn't change any of the names of the rides during their first full year. Going into the 2008 season, all of that would change. There was a major effort to rename and retheme all the Paramount rides, though they tried to stay close to the general theme but give it a generic name. At Kings Island, two theaters and five rides were renamed. Most notably, Top Gun was renamed Flight Deck, and Tomb Raider was now The Crypt. Don Helbig said, Some guests are going to need time to adjust. They grew up with the park one way, and now it's going into something else. Another big change was that Racer would no longer run one side backwards. This started as a gimmick back in 1982, and it was so popular it stayed around for 26 years. What we're doing is getting back to the feel of the original Kings Island. That's something our older guests will remember and appreciate. Our younger guests, who have only known one thing their whole lives, will find it different. But we're confident they'll come to love it as much as ever. Our theme this year is history, tradition, and nostalgia. We're getting back to being a homegrown park. The park knew that taking away this experience would be a tough sell for its guests who came to love the backwards racer. But that was just one of many challenges the park would face in 2008. The economy was struggling. The price of gas was spiking to nearly $3.50 a gallon. But Kings Island was hoping that as a regional park, they could stay afloat. The park was also hit with a legal defeat, losing their $20 million case against RCCA's insurance company. Kings Island won their lawsuit against RCCA in 2005. But once that company went out of business, the park sought payment from the Admiral Insurance Company. In 2008, a court of appeals ruled the insurance company did not have to pay, citing that commercial general liability policies do not cover claims of negligent manufacture. Kings Island also fought the Mason City Council on a proposed tax on park admissions, even threatening to de-annex from Mason and return to Deerfield Township. They did not want anything to raise their admission price, which in turn hurts attendance. Kings Island didn't welcome anything new in 2008, but they did draw in a lot of people with two acts. After years of denying Robbie Cadeville a chance to outshine his dad's jump from 1975, Kings Island under Cedar Fair was more open to it. 
More than 40,000 people came to the park on May 24, many of them flocking to the park to see history being made. He landed the 200-foot jump over 24 Coke Zero trucks, hurting his back on the landing, but it was still a success. On the 4th of July, there was another family connection, as Rick Walenda broke his grandfather Carl's tightrope record, the one set at Kings Island back in 1974, covering 2,000 feet in just over 35 minutes. Cedar Fair was just breaking the ice on their new investment over its first two years in charge. By the summer of 2008, it was obvious something big was on the horizon. Kings Island didn't want to give too much away and let the speculation create some buzz. Don Helbig encouraged people to come to the park, take pictures of the construction, and watch this new roller coaster take shape. Every day, our guests ask, what is it? It's just one of those things you can see unfold in front of your eyes. No other details will be revealed. All we will tell people is it's going to be a ride. What kind of ride? People are just going to have to wait and see. Not only would Kings Island's new coaster create a big splash, it would be the start of a new era for the park. Kings Island was already one of the country's premier parks, but Cedar Fair was about to launch the park to new heights never seen before. New coaster. Hey, so Karen Johnson is live at the park with this big reveal tonight. Hi, Karen. Hello. You know, we have been telling you about this, even got our hands on some of the plans, but finally tonight it's official. But hold on to your hats because you've never seen anything like this before. On August 6, 2008, Kings Island unveiled the plans for their biggest project ever. At the cost of $22 million, Diamondback would be a B&M hypercoaster, standing 230 feet tall, exceeding 80 miles per hour and one mile of track. With 10 hills, six of them being over 100 feet, this was built purely for airtime, but it would have one bonus feature, a splashdown right before the final break run. As park spokesman Don Helbig said, it's exactly what everyone wants. It's big, it's fast, it's steel. Diamondback was rising right as the economy was crashing, and by the end of 2008, it was clear the country and the world was in for hard times. But Cedar Fair was still ready to invest $62 million in new rides for 2009, and attendance across the chain was up 6% over 2007. Diamondback's track was complete by January, and right after, the park opened an auction to be among the first riders. 96 people would bid for the honor, the top bidder getting to choose their seat on the first train, and everyone else being assigned a seat based on how much they paid. All proceeds would go to A Kid Again, a charity that funded trips for kids with severe illness. By March, the park had raised over $50,000, the top bid standing at $3,000, and the minimum bid rising to $75. By the end of March, the total reached $75,000, and they decided to increase the first rider event to include six trains. As the 2009 season ramped up, Diamondback was not the only new addition. This was located in Rivertown, and the whole area got a facelift with new walkways, landscaping, and fencing. There were also three new musical shows, and the ASA Action Sports World Tour would make a two-day stop in May, featuring BMX, skateboard, and motocross performers, along with concerts from Crooked X and Collective Soul. On April 18th, 256 people got to take part in the first rider event, raising a total of $102,000. 13-year-old Jackson Thurnquist saved nine months of allowance to pay $181 for a seat, and when asked if it was worth it, he said, I would have paid $1 billion. It is better than anything I've ever ridden. Diamondback was a smash hit, and it helped offset the mid-season closure of another major ride, Son of Beast. On June 16th, a woman notified the park that she had been injured after a ride on May 31st, and this started an investigation. She had a blood vessel burst in her brain and had to be admitted to the ICU. The Ohio Department of Agriculture wanted to know if the ride caused the injury. This was the fifth time the ODA had to investigate the ride. Coaster enthusiast and author Pete Trabuco said, The incident rate is high, and they are smart to close it down and look at every aspect of the ride. Nobody knew how long Son of Beast would be closed, and the park took it on a week-to-week -week basis. After six weeks, state investigators found no irregularities, but the park kept the ride closed, trying to decide what to do next. The woman who sparked the investigation was just one of many who came forward to contact the park, complaining of pain or injury after riding Son of Beast. By mid-August, Kings Island announced that Son of Beast would be shut down for the season. Although it cleared inspection, there was a real concern if the ride was still enjoyable. The park would use the off-season to decide what to do next, Later in the year, Kings Island settled a lawsuit with one of the passengers from the 2006 accident, paying over $76,000 in damages. A forensic engineer testified that Kings Island's officials knew about the ride's problems from the start and tried to fix them in a band-aid fashion, causing problems elsewhere. The plaintiff, Jennifer Wright, said, 
My biggest hope now is the public will be aware of the issues with Son of Beast, and that situation will be rectified so nobody else has to suffer, ever. The park also continued their battle with the city of Mason over a tax on admissions. They even put a message on the marquee, reading, Mason wants to tax you. Tell them no. While Kings Island was being sued and fighting the city, Cedar Fair was seeking a buyer to alleviate their $1.6 billion in debt, and they found one in Apollo Management, buying the chain for $2.4 billion. The sale wasn't expected to bring major visible change, but the deal faced immediate objection from investors. They said the shareholders would get meager returns, and the board members would see massive profits. They also tried to force CEO Richard Kinzel out of his position. The shareholder response was strong enough to scrap the entire deal by early 2010. Kinzel, age 70 at the time, chose to retire shortly after. At the same time, Kings Island was victorious in their fight against the new tax, as the city council voted it down. When Paramount bought the Kings Entertainment Parks in 1992, they were granted the rights to the Hanna-Barbera brand through 2009. Having to say goodbye to Scooby-Doo for the first time in the park's history, Cedar Fair's contract with Nickelodeon also expired, so it was time to overhaul the entire Nickelodeon universe and replace it with their own brand, Planet Snoopy. This would cause a retheme for everything in the area, turning the Hanna-Barbera and Nickelodeon attractions into all things Peanuts. Charlie Brown, Lucy, Snoopy, Woodstock, and the whole gang, and Scooby-Doo and the Haunted Castle became Boo Blasters on Boo Hill. While Planet Snoopy was gearing up for a big debut season, Son of Beast would remain dormant. Before opening day, the park announced their Hyper Wooden Coaster would not open in 2010. They had poured $30 million into it, and they were looking for the right proposal to fix it. In the meantime, the park would remove its large box sign, and they were debating whether or not to take it off the map. In the end, they left it off. For the 2011 season, Kings Island announced Windseeker, a Mondial swing ride that would also be coming to three other Cedar Fair parks that year. This joined the Eiffel Tower and the Drop Tower as the park's 300-foot rides, tilting riders out at 45 degrees and spinning around at 45 miles per hour. 2011 would also turn back time 65 million years, with more than 60 life-size animatronic dinosaurs invading the park. This was Dinosaurs Alive, combining entertainment with education, as guests could learn about the dinosaurs and even control their movements as they walked along a 4,000-foot path behind the racer. This would cost an extra $5 on top of park admission. The park would also introduce Dinosaurs Alive 3D at the Action Theater, and that would last three seasons until the theater's closure. 2011 would be another dormant year for Son of Beast. It wasn't even on the list of rides filed with the state, so there was no permit to legally operate the ride. Cedar Fair's new CEO, Matt Wieman, came to Kings Island in the summer of 2011 and weighed in on the ride, saying the company had to be creative with it, but it's still too early to say what the right answer is. He also wanted to test out a new system like Disney's FastPass, where guests could wait in a virtual line. In July, the park introduced Fastlane, where guests could pay for a wristband and that would give them access to a special queue, bypassing the normal line. At the end of the summer season, the park tried to break a record for the world's largest human awareness ribbon. The current record was over 3,900 people, and Kings Island came well short despite drawing in almost 3,000. The attempt did raise over $10,000 to fight breast cancer. The Crypt, formerly known as Tomb Raider the Ride, was closed after the 2011 season, the park announcing it had reached the end of its service life. The big addition for Kings Island's 40th anniversary would be Soak City, yet another massive expansion of their water park, formerly known as Boomerang Bay. This would have a $10 million price tag, and it would double the size of the park to 33 acres. It would include a new 39,000 square foot wave pool, an action river replacing the Lazy River, volleyball courts, lounge areas, and other amenities. By the end of the 2012 season, Kings Island would be gearing up for a major overhaul of the racer, including replacing sections of track, posts, braces, and ledgers giving new life to the 40-year-old park original that had given over 97 million rides. The racer was here to stay, but Son of Beast was not. In July, park officials announced their decision to tear it down. This was the official, sad, anticlimactic end to one of the most troubled coasters ever built. Son of Beast wasn't the only casualty of 2012. Thunder Alley, the park's go-karts that was adjacent to Son of Beast was removed after 17 seasons. There was a good reason for this. Kings Island wasn't about to leave the site vacant, and four years after the debut of Diamondback, it was time for a brand new coaster. Throughout 2013, the groundwork was being laid for the so-called 2014 project. Public records show this was a roller coaster, and not just any coaster, the most expensive project in the park's history.
With a $24 million price tag, Banshee would open as the world's longest inverted coaster. Bolger and Mabillard had brought Diamond back to the park in 2009, and they would get this project also. Their inverted model was very popular in the 1990s, with fewer installations since 2000, and Banshee would be the first of its kind in America since 2006. It would be themed to a screeching female spirit, a wailing mythological messenger from the underworld. When riders reach the top of the 167-foot lift hill, the Banshee screams before twisting down the 150-foot drop, hitting 68 miles per hour and flying through seven inversions. All this done over 4,127 feet of track. Like with Diamondback, Kings Island would set up a first rider auction for a kid again, asking for at least $100 per person. In April, the park invited over 1,000 media members and coaster enthusiasts to get their first rides. This was believed to be the largest preview day in Cedar Fair history. Don Helbig was concerned the ride would not live up to the massive buzz it generated, but it got rave reviews. Just to complement the thrill aspect, Banshee's theming includes a graveyard in the queue, one tombstone, appropriately, dedicated to Son of Beast. This would not be the only way that Kings Island would pay homage to his past in 2014. Flight Deck would adopt the name of its predecessor, the Bat. The name change, along with its new orange color scheme, would be a fitting tribute to the pioneer that made this coaster possible. As Banshee was thrilling its early riders, Matt we met stated he wanted to take Cedar Fair down a different road. He knew thrill rides were a draw, but family memories brought people back. He gained this perspective after spending 17 years with the Disney Corporation. So while Banshee gave its 1 millionth ride, Diamondback gave its 10 millionth ride, The Beast gave its 50 millionth ride, and Racer gave its 100 millionth ride, Kings Island would shift its focus for the 2015 season. The park would bring in Woodstock Gliders, a Larson flying scooter ride, very similar to the Flying Eagles they just removed in 2004, as well as another addition for Planet Snoopy, Snoopy Space Buggies. This only improved on the 14-time Golden Ticket winner for Best Kids Area. Meanwhile, in 2014, evidence of those little extras that we met talked about started popping up. They debuted Cirque Imagine in the Kings Island Theater, an acrobatic show, and they set two world records while raising money for cancer research. One for shaving 213 heads at once, and the other for having 1,821 people apply lipstick at the same time. They also expanded Halloween Haunt, including the Slaughterhouse, a new building in Rivertown that was used for a haunted maze. Kings Island would also expand their food options, including an upgrade to the Funnel Cake Shop where guests could create a custom order, and they launched a beer festival that included three park-themed beers, Beast Bach, Banshee Brew, and Diamondback Ale. In August of 2015, the park was hyping up their next big announcement, but this wasn't for Kings Island, it would be for Soak City. Four years after its big expansion, it would be receiving a seven-story slide tower called Tropical Plunge, a set of six slides, three of them with a floor that drops out, sending the rider straight down. Keeping with the family-oriented theme, for the third time in the park's history, Winterfest was announced to return after a 12-year hiatus. After buying the Paramount Parks in 2006, one of Cedar Fair's first actions was to axe Winterfest. But with the new leadership at the top, and given the loud guest demand, this was logical for their mission statement. Winterfest would return for the 2017 season, with ice skating on the fountain, Christmas lighting scenes, a craft fair, and live entertainment. This would be included for gold and platinum pass holders. As Kings Island General Manager Greg Scheid said, Winterfest is all about family memories, family fun. But 2017 wouldn't be all about family fun. Early in the 2016 season, foundation design plans were filed with the city of Mason. This was called Kings Island 2017 Project, and it was clear it was a roller coaster. Some people thought this could be a 300-foot giga coaster, a model that other large-scale Cedar Fair parks had been receiving in recent years, like King's Dominion, Canada's Wonderland, and Carowinds. But upon further inspection, this didn't look like a 300-footer. It looked like a wooden coaster. On July 28th, the cat was out of the bag. Built by Great Coasters International, Mystic Timbers would be the newest addition to Rivertown. The park's 16th coaster would stand 109 feet tall, hit a top speed of 53 miles per hour, and feature 3,265 feet of track. This would give Kings Island 18,804 feet of wooden coaster track, even without Son of Beast, setting a world record. Its theme would be an area surrounding a lumber company, becoming overrun by mysterious Medusa-like overgrowth of vines as nature reclaims its land. But the big teaser would be, what's in the shed? After hitting the final brakes, the train would enter a shed before going back to the station, and that piqued everyone's interest. Was it a drop track? Was it an inversion? 
what was in the shed. Greg Scheid would leave the company, being replaced by Mike Kuntz, and he oversaw the opening of the park's new wooden coaster the following spring. He said, Wooden roller coasters used to be the only roller coasters around, but with 16 airtime hills and a 53 mile an hour top speed, the ride generates new thrills and new memories for the enthusiast. It may not have been anywhere near a record breaker, but its 16 airtime hills and twisted out and back layout made the ride instantly popular. With the modern steel monsters popping up all over the park, plus the beast right there in Rivertown, many people considered Mystic Timbers the best ride in the park. Later that year, Amusement Today awarded it with the Golden Ticket Award for Best New Ride. As for the shed, some people were impressed, others were disappointed. But regardless, everyone was sharing their opinions. Rather than giving away the surprise, I'll leave it up to you to find out for yourself. After seven seasons, Dinosaurs Alive would be removed, as the park was making way for future development. But it wouldn't be the only one. At the beginning of Halloween Haunt in 2018, a sign appeared at a makeshift funeral site, reading, The air is eerily calm as we make final preparations for the ill-fated demise of one of our own. The park's Twitter account did confirm this would be a coaster, and its final day would be October 28th. There was a lot of speculation over the next week. Some thought it would be Vortex, others believed it would be Firehawk. After Dinosaurs Alive was removed, Firehawk may be next to clear enough land for a major new ride. Sure enough, the park confirmed the Doom ride was Firehawk. Serving 12 seasons at Kings Island and 18 overall, Firehawk would not be finding a new home this time. It was completely scrapped. Now, the rumor mill was hot over what could replace both Dinosaurs Alive and Firehawk. Some thought it may be a revival of Son of Beast. Others believed it would be that long-awaited Giga Coaster. By the end of 2018, paperwork was filed for something described as the 2018, 2019, and 2020 additions and modifications to Kings Island Park. And this mentioned Bollinger and Mabillard, the designer and builder of Diamondback and Banshee. In the meantime, Kings Island was teasing their 2019 attraction, stating, Something old will be new again. This fueled even more speculation about a Son of Beast revival, but in August, they announced the return of the antique cars, resurrecting a park classic 14 years after the removal. This would be located in the Coney Mall next to the racer, slightly south of the prior site, now being used by Backlot Stunt Coaster. These would be a two-thirds scale model of the 1911 Ford Model T, and per Mike Coons, when we ask guests what they would like to see return to Kings Island, the most popular response, by far, is the antique cars. 2019 would also bring a new restaurant to Rivertown, the Miami River Brew House, replacing the Reds Hall of Fame Grill, as well as One Team Village, a new complex of dorms meant for employees living more than 25 miles from the park. This would accommodate 400 workers at a cost of $65 per week. The park also kicked off its second Winterfest, opening and theming more of the park, adding more rides, and USA Today named Kings Island the second best park to visit over Christmas, just behind Silver Dollar City, and just months after rewarding Kings Island the number one spot for their Halloween hunt. For the 2019 season, Kings Island would offer a free ticket to one child under four feet tall for every regular adult ticket bought online. In addition to the family-friendly antique autos, the park would also welcome in the Grand Carnival, an international festival advertised as celebrating the sights, sounds, and smells of various cultures. This would be the big summer event to draw in more people, going along with the Halloween haunt and Winterfest in the fall and winter. The highlight of Grand Carnival would be the spectacle of color parade every night starting at the Coney Mall, going to International Street, and circling the Royal Fountain, lasting 30 to 40 minutes. The park may have been catering to kids and families in 2019, but behind the scenes, they were gearing up for something big. In mid-August, they told everyone to expect an announcement for a major new addition, setting up an event open to all guests in the Coney Mall on August 15th. Based on blueprints filed with the city of Mason, this was called Project X, and it was a 300-foot roller coaster. It looked like, finally, Kings Island would get their giga, and before a massive crowd, Mike Koontz unveiled Orion. Amid the chants of Giga, 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 Koot said, You wanted it, you got it. Although it would stand 287 feet tall, it dropped into a ravine, reaching the 300 foot mark. This $30 million project would cost about the same amount as the entire park did back in 1972. But Cedar Fair was experiencing a big boom, with revenues increasing 8% from 2018, riding the business model of putting major attractions in their biggest parks. But there was some unexpected, unwelcome news the following month. 
The legendary Vortex, the world's first six inversion coaster, had finally reached the end of its service life. The park stated, coasters like this normally last 25 to 30 years, and Vortex was nearing the end of its 33rd season, giving almost 46 million rides. Over the month of October, people flocked to Kings Island to ride Vortex one last time. On the night of October 27th, following the final train, the park played taps and turned out the lights on Vortex for good. With Vortex gone, the park was looking ahead to the future. Orion went vertical in early September, and it was topped off in early November. Orion was set to open with the park on April 11th, and another first rider auction was set up. Riders would have to give at least $150 to take part on April 9th. Kings Island was booming, Cedar Fair's profits were up, and the park was creating rapid economic growth for Warren County. But the coronavirus coming to our shores threatened all of that. By mid-March, sports leagues were suspending or canceling events. Businesses were shutting down, and opening day had to be delayed. The park was hoping to reopen in mid-May. By mid-April, shortly after the supposed opening day, the park announced that season passes and all add-ons would be extended through 2021. There was too much uncertainty around when the park had finally opened. In the meantime, park officials were gearing up for a safe reopening, ordering thousands of face masks and setting up plexiglass. But they would still need to staff the park once they got the green light from the governor. They would also go cashless to avoid additional contact points and reduce their capacity by one-third allowing no more than 15,000 guests in the park per day so people could spread out. This would require a reservation system. By late May, parks around the country were starting to open up, but the parks in Ohio were still ordered to be closed. The governor announced that museums and other indoor entertainment centers could open by June 10th, but amusement parks had to wait. Cedar Fair CEO Richard Zimmerman pled his case, stating that they were experts at managing risks and following protocols, and Kings Island joined Cedar Point in a lawsuit to allow the parks to open. The next day, the governor announced that amusement parks could open in two weeks, starting on June 19th. Kings Island worked quickly to staff the park, and by July 2nd, they were open to pass holders and open to everyone starting on July 12th. Every guest would need a reservation. They would need to complete a pre-visit health screening. They would have their temperature checked, and they would have to wear a mask and follow social distancing markers throughout the park. Not to be lost in the chaos, Orion was finally ready to open with the park. Its first rider benefit was on July 1st, and it officially opened to pass holders on July 2nd. Guests would enter Area 72, the former X-Base, and its theme would be a secret research facility, one that has been studying the effects of flight on man. Flight of Fear fit well into the new theme, as did Orion, themed to a simulator that would launch riders to a new planet in the Orion constellation. This would top USA Today's poll for best new attraction in 2020. Despite Orion's popularity, Cedar Fair inevitably took a tremendous financial loss. Third quarter revenue was down 88% from the prior year, and by year's end, they had an operating loss of over half a billion dollars. Haunt and Winterfest were canceled, replaced with Tricks and Treats, a food festival. 2021 was cautiously shaping up to be a better year, with the park's opening day set for May 15th, about a month later than usual. They would also open Camp Cedar, a luxury outdoor resort where guests could rent cabins, RV sites, and take advantage of pools, cabanas, fitness areas, food trucks, and so much more. This was slated for a June opening, but that was pushed back to mid-July. But with the ongoing pandemic, Kings Island was aware that people may be apprehensive about coming back to the park, but they were hoping that pent-up demand, as well as a hunger to go back to normal, would bring them through the gates. But like every industry nationwide, the shortage of labor became a huge problem. In order to fill 4,000 positions, they hosted a virtual hiring event and offered hourly wages from $11 to $14. This was increased to $15, and even $18 for some positions going along with a $3,000 bonus. Despite the incentives, staffing remained a problem. On May 22nd, the park was particularly crowded, and although the rides were fully staffed, the food stands, restaurants, and gift shops were not. There were reports of one security guard watching four metal detectors. People were stuck in long lines at the food stands, and there wasn't much security inside the park. There were altercations among young people in the park, with several small fights breaking out and one big one just before 10 p.m. The park closed down 30 minutes early that night to restore order. They responded to this incident by increasing security and assuring the public that safety is their top priority. The park would start closing two hours early in June, just because they couldn't find enough workers to staff the park. Despite the shorter hours and lack of staff, 2021 saw attendance return to pre-pandemic levels. This was true not only at Kings Island, but across the industry. Kings Island would also bring back their special events, Halloween Haunt and Winterfest. Things were going back to normal, except for one aspect. The park would officially go cashless. Guests could use cash-to-card kiosks inside the park, 
But everywhere else in the park, only credit cards, debit cards, Apple Pay, or Google Pay would be accepted. Going into the 2022 season, the park was keeping wages steady between $15 and $18.50 per hour. They would also focus on refreshing some of its classic rides for its 50th anniversary, including a repaint of the Eiffel Tower, retracking of the Beast, and a major restoration for the Grand Carousel. However, Slingshot would be shut down after 20 seasons, and it was taken out to make way for future plans. What those plans are, we don't know, because that brings us all the way to today. What started with the flood at the old Coney Island has brought us this massive destination park today. Through all its turmoil, through all its changes in ownership, and through all the great times, Kings Island has become one of the most beloved parks in the country. But whatever happened at the old Coney Island? After closing in 1971 and having all its rights taken out, it reopened in 1972 with a sunlight pool and a picnic grove in 1973. In 1991, Coney Island was bought by Ronald Walker, and he started turning Coney Island back into an amusement park with small rides and even a roller coaster called Python in 1999. But in 2019, they decided to close down all of their amusement rides and focus on one thing, being a water park. This park is open to this day, so if you're in the Cincinnati area and you want to visit a park dripping in history, check out Coney Island. Thanks for joining me on this journey through the 50 years of Kings Island. If you can drop this video a like and share this whole series with anyone who may be interested, I'd appreciate it. This documentary was months in the making, so I appreciate your support. As some of you may know, I grew up going to Magic Mountain, but over the last four years, Kings Island has slowly become my all-time favorite park. From its ride collection, to its atmosphere, to its outstanding staff, so it was an honor to dive into this park's rich history and bring you its story. I want to thank everyone who lent their photos and videos to this project, including CoasterBob62, Sean Flaherty, and Jeff Joyner, whose dad, Bob Joyner, has an extensive photo gallery that he was willing to share with me. Also, since Kings Island seems to do everything well, their amazing YouTube channel was also a big help. So thank you all again for sticking through this with me, and I'll see you all in the next one.